Hey everyone, Serena here. I got uh, all my seeds, so many seeds. Uh, <laughs> so all these seeds that I have here are my leftover seeds from last year, this, this mountain. Um, there is a lot of seeds here and uh, last year I probably spent like 10 hours talking about what I have here and I don't want to do that. I want to try to get through this as quickly as possible but um, if you guys have any questions about specific stuff while I'm going through it just just let me know um, but I'm, I'm maybe not going to read out like every single seed variety that I have in here um, but yeah okay so before I tell you about all these seeds oh it's too heavy <laughs> um, I, I want to give you guys a little bit of a backstory as to why I have so many seeds because the amount of seeds that I have is is a little bit ridiculous even for like the concept of of having like the farm that we have you know like this this is like some of the farm seed that we have and so we have like these big volume amounts and like this this is normal for farm seed this is because you want to have enough that you can plant you know like r for radishes i do six rows and my you know let's say i plant 25 feet at a time so you know i'm i'm seeding what is that like 150 feet of radishes and i'm doing that every single every single week so you need a large volume of seeds when when you're doing the farming um, so that's normal, like, and that's why a lot of, a lot of my seeds are so expensive, like my, because the volume just adds up, you know, like, it, like, here's a good example. So this is, this is a pack of carrots. This pack of carrots is $25, but it's because there's 10,000 carrot seeds in it. Um, so th that, that's part of the reason why my, my seed collection does get so expensive. Because, yeah, like, for context, last year I spent $3,000 on seeds, and this year I'm I'm hoping that I've kept it to $2,500 on seeds. So, like, that's a really big number, um, but it's a huge amount that I'm growing for context. You know, like, f the farm is growing enough to feed 100 families. And then the other part, which is, like, why I have, like... A ridiculous thing like this this is my bag of pumpkins and I have like you know a million different varieties of pumpkins in here which if as a farmer I wouldn't do that I'd pick you know three pumpkins that I like and I would grow three pumpkins um, but last year to kickstart our farming season we we did um, like a seedling sale so I have a lot of varieties in here that stuff that I grew so I had selection at the seedling sale but I um you know I didn't I didn't grow it for myself and and so there's a lot <laughs> a lot of the volume of seeds that are in here are things that I have to be able to do seedling sales again so um so yeah like you know I'm growing like you know last year I had I don't know like 400 500 pumpkin seedlings that I grew because you know I had you know I had 20 of the 25 varieties in this bag and then you know I sold some and then I planted a few for myself and then you know some of them just just went to waste um but but yeah that's that's why there's so much here this is too many seeds <laughs> you should have a reason if you have this many seeds because the you know even this this bag of pumpkins this is more than I'm going to be able to probably go through um you know ho hopefully some of these packs you know like if so okay so we're doing seedling sales again this year so that's that's why I kept these seeds if I wasn't going to keep doing seedling sales um, at this point, I'd go through, you know, this bag of pumpkins and I'd pick out the pumpkins that I know that I specifically like and I'd keep them and then I'd give away the seeds for the pumpkins that I don't like, but I know that other people like and that's why I bought them for the seedling sale. So, <laughs> 
that's the backstory why I have this mountain of seeds. But I know you guys are all obsessed. You keep sending me messages and you're like, but what what specific seeds are in there? You you want to know all the details and I'm obsessed, so of course I will come and I will talk about all the details with you guys anytime. Anytime you want to talk about seeds, sure. Like no problem. <laughs> my kids are my kids are currently like being my daughter's at school, my son has daycare on Wednesdays, so let's do this. I got two and a half hours till I have to get my daughter from the bus stop, so we should be able to get a healthy amount of seed talking going. Oh, one one other thing. Oh, so uh, in regards to if the seedling sale is worth it. Um, so last year, you know, I was talking about doing the seedling sale and everyone got really, really excited about the idea of seedling sales. And, uh, and they were all like, I'm going to do a seedling sale too. Like, oh, like it's such an amazing way to make a bunch of money. Um, the, it's, it's, like, we are not going to make money at the seedling sale this year. We didn't make money at the seedling sale last year. And I don't necessarily advise people to go out and to, like, buy, you know, seeds to do a seedling sale. Um, just because it it is a lot of work in return for, for the profit. Um, like, we have reasons outside of the money to do the seedling sale because at this point we're basically using it to try to build our farm business. You know, the, like, our seedling sale is, is basically like a, like a door crasher Black Friday deal is, is how it's functioning for, for the farm business. It's, it's like a way to, to get growing early, to, to get customers coming to us early and to get our name out there in a way other than just having the vegetables. Um, so last year I made a video after the seedling sale because I, I was like, don't do it guys. Um, where I talked about a lot of the, the details of the seedling sale. Um, it isn't on this channel because, so we don't have comments on this channel because like YouTube categorized our, our channel as like a children's channel or something. And so YouTube just doesn't allow us to, to have comments on our videos. Um, but it happened last year and we tried to start a second channel to have a spot to have comments, but then we, we are just so busy with doing the farming that, you know, it was hard enough just to keep up with putting some videos out for you guys on, on, on this channel, let alone trying to build up the second channel to get the comments back. Um, so we, we scrapped that idea like last year, but so I, I have this video about like the, what it costs actually to do the seedling sale. And I really like it. <laughs> um, so I was thinking that at some point I want to, um, take it down off of my other channel and re-release it here. Um, you know, before people go out and start seedling sales based on the fact that, you know, they're like, oh, what a great idea, Serena. Um, and then I was thinking that I would, you know, I'd re-release it so you guys can see it here. And then I'd maybe do a live video where we talk specifically just about, you know, like economics of seedlings and, and things like that, because it, it is something that last year lots of people wanted to talk about. And I know a ton of you like are new, new here now. We just had a huge spike. Um, and so I don't want you guys all going out and doing seedling sales because it's a bad idea. Don't do it. Basically don't do anything I do. Like, you know, other than like, the only video I stand behind is like how to grow yourself a small cut flower garden. But anything you see me doing, like I 100% think it's a bad idea. So like do as I say, don't do as I do. That's that's my that's the best advice I can give you in regards to my in regards to anything that's up here and anything you see me doing. Okay. So oh, so the other thing I wanted to talk to you guys about is uh how to store seeds because everyone's always like, Oh, Serena, tell us your like awesome seed storing technique. And then they also send me like, um, I'm sure you guys have all like seen it, but they're these, like they're called like photo boxes and they're like a big case. And then inside the case is like a smaller plastic case. That's like exactly the size of like a seed pack. And so those are super, super awesome way to store seeds. 
I don't do that because I have so many seeds. Um, but this, this is my system. So obviously you can see like what a great system it is. Uh, but it works for me somewhat. I mean, here, like this is the bottom of my pumpkin bag. So you can see there is some problems to my system. Uh, <laughs> because yeah like all my seeds are spilling into the bottom of this but yeah so my system is that I clump uh like types of seeds together and then uh that's funny I've, I've totally had people say that to me before about the like I don't even know how to say your name but that makes me laugh um yeah so what I do is I get a plastic bag you know like a big ziploc bag and I make sure that it doesn't have any holes in it. I make sure it's like a good bag. It's not like one of my, like, you know, been used 8,000 times before Ziplocs. And then I, ca I clump everything together inside the bag. The bag keeps it from any sort of moisture happening in the same way that keeping them in like a plastic box works. Um, and then, you know, I have like tons and tons of bags in, in my like big cardboard box because I have every single category of of seeds together and and that's my system it's it's not a great system but it is quite um it's the only way i can get all these seeds to fit into this small amount of space because like you know this this here has about like 10 10 seeds in it or 10 seed packs and it it folds up really flat and it, it stays together really well um but yeah so that's how i sort my seeds I like my system, um, but as I as I already said, uh, don't don't do what I do ever. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, the silica packs that's that's a good idea. Uh, we don't have to worry too much about moisture here because we're so dry here. Like we have like zero humidity problems ever. You know, it's like summers are great here. It gets up to like a hundred and it's like pleasant because it's dry. You know, so it's, you know, it's like being, it's like being in an oven or, or like a sauna versus a steam room. So like, I don't have to be quite as cautious about, about my seeds because moisture is the worst thing that can happen for, for your seeds. If, if you get any, like even in a really humid place, the moisture in the air will actually cause your seeds to start to germinate. And that's why, that's why you want to keep it like in plastic. And you basically only want to open up the plastic when you're, when you're actually working with the seeds you want to keep them shut and protected from from all that moisture as much as possible okay let's let's go into pumpkins because apparently that's the first one that i have here um so i am super picky about about seeds and like varieties like people are always asking me like oh serena do you do any like like seed what are they seed swaps do you like participate in seed swaps do you do do you do this and that and i don't do that because like not only am i like it it must be a spaghetti squash that's the only type of squash that i like but i also am like and it has to be you know this this isn't <laughs> this isn't acceptable this i have because clearly i like couldn't find this is a like a local company seed pack that I can find in store. But this is a non-acceptable uh, spaghetti squash variety. Uh, spaghetti, the variety squash, is not my preferred variety of spaghetti squash. In fact, I usually like Primero. That's my, uh, I'm pretty sure that's my preferred one. So I like, I'm snobby enough that I like even remember <laughs> my favorites. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, I like the amount of snobby that I am about seeds. So I have this huge, what I don't know, what am I getting at here? What I'm getting at is I have this pat, like mountain of seeds here. A ton of this stuff I don't like and I don't want to grow. Um, but I bought it because, at, you know, everyone has their own thing that they like. But yeah, so this, you know, I don't care about this, but I do love spaghetti squash. If I was to grow only, well, at my old at my old place where I had no space. I only grew two varieties of squash. I drew, I grew spaghetti squash, um, cause it's super productive and it, it keeps really well. And then conveniently the next one in the pack. Um, and then the other variety of squash that I grew is, uh, it's a, I always, I want to say like kombucha, but I don't know if that's me just like accidentally saying kombucha, 
<laughs> mispronouncing it, but uh, they're like a Japanese pumpkin. And then even beyond just like the kabucha, this is the specific one I'm pretty sure that I like. This uh, first taste variety is the is the kabucha that I like. And this this seed pack is just a generic. It doesn't because this, this is a bigger sized um, one. But let me see if I can find a picture because they're they're super pretty. So that's one problem doing this live. I don't have like a ton of time to go through all this and make like it. Yeah, they so they kind of look like this is is what the kabucha squashes look like. But um, they're outside, green on the outside and orange flesh, and they're like super rich and super sweet. Um, but yeah, so if, if I was going to grow only two squashes, it would be spaghetti squash and these kabucha squashes. Um, last year I grew a few more, and I'll probably grow a few more this year too. Uh, you know, like like here's another one. I, I, like, I like an acorn squash, you know, like something, something like this. Um, when it comes to pumpkins, squash pumpkins, um, I prefer a vining variety. They, they sprawl, but I find that the vining instead of the bush varieties of pumpkin squash, um, they produce more. And the, my technique is I'll grow them all together and then I'll just, I'll get them to all like overlap each other. So instead of you know, the vine, it takes up so much space. I'll basically like turn it into like a jungle of vines and they'll be like out competing each other. Where I find if you do like the bush, you know, it, it, it's just in its spot. It's big, it's bulky. Um, so I find I can really push, uh, production to, you know, limited space with the vines where I haven't been able to have the same luck of really pushing extra production with, with like a bush squash. And usually, um, these like an acorn squash is is a bush it's hard to find like a vining acorn squash and so in at my old place where I didn't have much space I, I never really um prioritized them I, re I like the flavor of them but I just couldn't get them to produce as much as I wanted them to do um and then the other trick that I used to do at our old place uh is I'd plant like the pumpkins and winter squash on the edge of the garden and Ian hated this this like if your husband likes grass like obviously I named this channel you can't eat the grass so I'm pretty anti-grass um but I'd plant them on the outside of the garden and then I just let them grow through the lawn and Ian would get crazy because he'd be like oh, I can't the lawn's getting all overgrown because I can't mow down your pumpkins and I was like it's fine like we'll mow it like before winter comes um, so that was, that was my trick for getting extra space because the, they're in, they were in the dirt of the garden and, and I could weed around the base. So they weren't, the weeds weren't competing for nutrients that the plant was uptaking, but then wherever it vined to, it didn't matter. Or we also, we had a fence and I'd vine them up and down the fence. And so that, that was a great way to get more production out of winter squash, pumpkins, um, than, than just, you know. Kind of the traditional way of growing them that you'll see you know written on the back of a seed pack for how to grow them okay here's another type of squash i really like it's it's a acorn squash or no sorry uh a butternut squash and uh this variety is walt waltham butternut um the this all my squashes i grew really badly so i, I can't really judge any of them based on what i did last year um but the the flavor was really good on these and they're supposed to be big mine were just teeny tiny babies because i planted like i majorly over planted them all um but oh this okay guys this i got a bunch of these uh i'm not i'm not even gonna bother trying to say what it is i'll just hold it very still um this is insane this pumpkin um we, we got a few of them and they, they're stunted too. They're, you know, they're like this big. They're like a proper pumpkin size, but they're supposed to get like quite big. This thing, um, tastes, it, when I sliced it open, it like the, the kids were there and they're like, are you cutting open a watermelon? It, it's like super, super like melony, almost, like almost like a cantaloupe. And, and even, even the flesh, it wasn't super sweet, but it was like, it did not taste like a pumpkin. 
Um, sorry, I'm just trying to read some of these comments. It's it's really hard to read the comments while while also talking. It's way easier to do lives when Ian's here because then we can like switch back and forth um, between between taking turns uh, for for reading. Um, I at sixty five hundred feet is pretty high, so I, like I don't actually know anything that's like really specific like that. Um, you know, probably best to Google's going to be your best bet because you'll be able to get like really specific information in regards to that. Um, like we're, we're not super high here in the Okanagan. Um, you know, we're kind of like, I think we're like 1500 above sea level here. We're kind of like, and, and I only know it because of canning. I'm like, we're borderline having to like bump up to like adding a bit of extra time for canning, but yeah, our, our elevation, excuse me, sorry. Our elevation doesn't, doesn't affect any of our growing. Um, and we, we're, we're pretty lucky for growing here. It's, it's super dry. So we have, we have to irrigate. Um, but, but because it's dry, we don't have a ton of fungal issues. You know, we can really control water with the irrigation. And then we, you know, we don't have a super, super long season. We're zone five. Um, so kind of beginning mid-May is uh, last frost and then kind of, you know, mid-October is our first frost. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, we have a decent growing season and then, um, you know, July, August, September, we get a lot of heat. So I'm pretty lucky for like, you know, I, I can't help a lot for a lot of like disease and pest and like hard hard growing conditions just because I'm so lucky here that I don't, <laughs> I don't have to deal with a lot of that. Um, uh, yeah, for the, the gardening story, that's Ian, Ian was like, Serena, you need to like make a new channel trailer. <laughs> um, cause he, he hates our current channel trailer. He thinks it's lame. I was like, it's perfect because then people know what her names are and I don't have to say it at the beginning of every single video. Um, but, but yeah, I, I think, I think we're going to make like, you know, a quick snappy, like what the story is. Um, yeah. Cause why am I on a farm and why am I crazy lady with all these seeds who won't shut up about seeds? This is, this is a good question that I should probably find an answer to. <laughs> okay. Here's another one. I have a Burgess buttercup. Um, I wouldn't normally grow this. I bought this cause this is a variety that people like. Oh, these. Okay. These are, these were super cute. And I was actually pretty happy with how these grow. Um, this is Jack B. Little. This is like a little decorative pumpkin. These are like, you know, a little gourd that you grow for Halloween. Um, I bought this and I also bought this um, all sorts formula mix. And it's like a mini gourd, you know, that like they're about this big. They're, they're really tiny. They, they suited the, the mini pumpkin really well. And, and I bought these, uh, for my kids. I bought these because I thought my kids would really like this. And and I grew these and I was actually, because I've never grown gourds before. Because So one thing about pumpkins is um, summer squash, winter squash, gourds, all of that stuff, they, they'll they cross pollinate each other. Um, and I usually will eat uh, like self-seeded, cross pollinated, like basically like zucchini pumpkins that get self-seeded into my my compost um so i've been really resistant to ever planting gourds in the garden because as soon as you introduce a gourd into the cross pollinating whatever you get is going to be a nasty you don't want to eat it gourd <laughs> so to be able to keep eating my uh my compost squash i couldn't ever grow gourds but i have too much stuff now i don't have to worry about eating out of my compost <laughs> anymore so I, I finally grew gourds this year and the the production was really good and and like they kept super good and i had um i had issues with with um with not getting my pumpkins out they they got kind of frosted because we got home it was like minus we we were on the airplane and I was like, oh my god, I have to get home. It's gonna freeze tonight to pick all my pumpkins. And by the time I got there, it was it it was already below zero. So a bunch of my pumpkins actually got damaged. But the gourds, like they they actually were pretty pretty um pretty sheltered from the frost. Um yeah, so for growing for the farm, we are going to we definitely have like season extension stuff. Um, we have a couple of just like the simple 
Um, like our greenhouses, they're not heated. They're basically, you know, the equivalent of a tall row cover. And then we also have some extra plastic. Um, and then for pest management this year, we're, we bought some like mesh. Basically you put it over your crops and the bugs can't get in because it's, you know, basically putting mosquito netting <laughs> over, over your plants. So there's a, there's a lot of new stuff that we're going to be, be doing this year. And we'll, we'll share all that like in, in videos as, as we use it. Um, you know, that's, that's the kind of stuff that <clears throat> makes a lot, a lot more interesting of a video if, if I can actually show you using it and how it works rather than me explaining it. And I also, I, you know, I don't know all the, the nuances of it yet because I haven't, I haven't used it yet. So I want to work with it a bit before I give any, any advice on it. Cause if not, it's just me like paraphrasing what you can get on a quick Google. Um, okay. So here's another squash that I wouldn't grow myself, but people like, and you know, I was, I was pretty interested in it to see, um, but they didn't really do much. This is a blue ballet. And what are these called? These are, these are a Hubbard squash. So they, they get quite big. They get like pumpkin big. Um, you know, I, I prefer like a sweeter, like a sweeter orange, um, squash and that one. And here's, here's another one. I do not like these. This is a Curie and, and, um, and these, I, I don't like the flesh. I find it like super dry and like pasty. Um, but people who, who love these, like love them. They're their favorite. So I definitely, I made sure to buy a bunch of these. Um, yeah. And definitely heard of Elliot Coleman. He's, you know, he's like, <laughs> um, gotta know about Elliot Coleman. He's like, he's like the, the grandfather of, of all this, all these people like me going out and starting, starting a little farm. Um, okay. So here's another, uh, um, kombucha, um, squash. Uh, this one is called Shokichi. Um, and, uh, I, I tried it, but I lost track of what it was. So I didn't actually, I wasn't able to do a comparison side by side because my normal go-to on the kombucha is first taste. Um, I'll probably do better of a, of a test on that, on this. Um, this year, because like I said, they're one of my favorite squash. Um, you know, I guess, okay. I'm like, oh, half an hour. I haven't even like gone through pumpkins. <laughs> um, but I guess at a certain point, like the, the thought behind why I have this mountain of seeds is probably more useful to you guys than even, even what, what I like have here. Um, so what I do when I'm, when I'm like shopping is you know, I'll, I'll always experiment. So, you know, like I said, I, I like spaghetti squash. Here's a spaghetti squash and I like kabucha squash. So I know these are my favorite. I know these are my go-to. I'd make sure every year to have these. These are like permanent in the farm, in the garden. But I really like, I really like winter squash. I really like having them. Um, uh, for seed saving stuff, I, like it's, it's actually really technical <laughs> to get into it. Um, so I, I just don't do it and, and I don't know the numbers I've, I've looked into it enough to know that it's complicated enough that I don't want to do it. <laughs> that's, that's my opinion on seed saving. So I, I don't actually have a ton of details on seed saving other than I a hundred, I know enough about seed saving to know that it's a hundred percent worth it to get someone else to grow my seed for me. <laughs> that's, that's my opinion on seed saving. You know, there, unless it's like something that that is like, oh, I can't get it anywhere else. So I'm going to put in the effort to like do the work. Um, I highly, highly appreciate seed farmers <laughs> who do all this work for me. I highly appreciate seed farmers who make it so that I can spend what I consider, you know, a very reasonable amount of money and get this like mountain of amazing, awesome seeds and like, you know, all these amazing resources that seed companies provide. I'm, you know. I, I, I never, I never b like feel bad spending money on seed. I always think it's money really, really well, really well spent. Um, and for the no comments, it's, I know that there's ways to turn comments back on. We can't turn comments back on. Our comments have been completely disabled for our channel. It's, we've definitely, <laughs> we've, we've done the research. Maybe one of these days. Like I'll be big enough that I get a contact with YouTube and I can be like, Hey guys, like I'm pretty sure like, you know, 
a vegetable gardening channel is not a children's channel. Um, but you know, I mean, I'm whatever you like all my contacts down below. You, you guys can get, we're happy for you guys to get a hold of us, but, uh, you know, I'm not going to stress about the no comments. Um, okay. So as I was saying, the way I pick seeds, I've grown stuff long enough. I know what I like. So I keep growing the stuff that I know I like. And then every year I will be like, oh, you know, I've, I've been, I've been this, I've been seeing this. I've been seeing other people growing this, uh, heart of gold, uh, delicata, uh, like squash. I, I really like it. I, it sounds really good. So this year, in addition to my core varieties, I'm going to add this and I'm going to experiment with this and, and then I'm going to see if I like it. And then at the end of the season, you know, I'll, I'll be like, did I like it? Did I not like it? And you know, maybe I try it and I'm like, oh my God, this is so good. This is like, we like this more than we like spaghetti squash. So we're not growing spaghetti squash anymore. We're only growing these. These are our core ones. Um, and then the other thing that I tend to do every couple of years is if there's something that I really, really love, like this kabucha squash, um, when, when I first discovered it, there was just kabucha. There wasn't any varieties there. Like, you know, it was kind of like a newer variety. I hadn't really seen it anywhere else other than at West Coast Seeds. Um, so, you know, I just grew that, I grew that. And then a few years later, you know, it, other people had tried it. Other people thought that this was a really good, like pumpkin and they wanted to grow it too. And then West Coast Seeds started to bring in like multiple varieties of the kabuchas. Um, so then people could, you know, grow the kabucha that's best suited to their growing conditions. Um, so I'd see that those were popping up. And then I'd be like, you know what, I'm going to do a seed trial. And what I do is I buy, you know, they had three separate varieties. So I w bought every single variety of the kabucha squash. And then I, you know, I very clearly marked which was which. And to do like a proper trial, I'd probably grow, you know, not just one. Oh, I'm dropping my seeds everywhere. I wouldn't grow just one of each of the of the varieties, I'd probably grow like two or three. So I'd, you know, maybe that year I wouldn't grow any other winter squash other than the kabuchas. And I'd grow three of each variety and I'd have them clearly marked. And then at the end of the season, I'd compare like which flavor is better? Which plant did better? Did one of the plants have disease issues? Did one of the plants, you know, get powdery mildew really, really badly in the heat of the summer? That's something that I deal with. Um, but this one, it was really awesome for powdery mildew. Um, you know, basically I'll do a seed trial of different varieties in my garden. And then at the end of, of that, I'll make a decision. I'll be like, okay, out of those three, this one was the best. And then in the next years, this would become the core, the core kabucha squash that I grew. And then, you know, then I keep every year I keep experimenting, you know, then I'd be like, oh, I'm going to try, I'm going to try this pinnacle spaghetti squash this year because I want to see if this does better than, than the, than spaghetti, spaghetti squash, um, you know, and, and that's kind of, you know, when you first start, uh, like when you have your first garden, kind of sometimes the seed pack aisle in the dollar store or the seed pack aisle in Walmart is, is like a really good place to start because they'll go and they'll have pump. Yeah. They'll have, like, oh, my cats are being crazy. They'll have pumpkin, right? And it'll be like, there, there is no choice. It's just, if you want pumpkin, they have pumpkin. And then if you want, if you want squash, they have squash, right? And so you don't, you don't have to overthink things. You don't have to get it too complicated, but then, you know, sometimes you go to those, like, you know, the seed catalogs and there's pages and there's pages and there's pages and there's a hundred different varieties, um, of, of the of pumpkins and, and you don't even know where to start. Um, <clears throat> you know, and that's, that's kind of, you know, that's like the next step after you grew pumpkin and you know that you like pumpkin, um, that's when you start, you know, kind of narrowing in on, on different varieties and, and different things. And kind of, you know, after you're like, okay, I, I know the difference between spaghetti squash and, you know, kabucha squash. 
then the next step after that is to start to, you know, narrow in on what is the specific variety that you want. Um, you know, but you kind of, you need to know your garden a little bit is, is the thing. You kind of, you need to be growing for, you know, a handful of years to understand what are your disease issues? Like what, what are your pest issues? Like what, what works, what doesn't, um, I don't normally grow a lot of like brassicas, like cabbage or broccoli or cauliflower, all those type of things, um, or <laughs> uh, Brussels sprouts, <laughs> like, because I can't, I just, I can't grow them. Um, and, you know, I've, I've kind of been like, what, like, they're so difficult, like, why, why should I even try to focus on them? You know, my time and my space is limited instead of, you know, fussing and fighting over trying to get a really good cabbage. What I'll do is I'll just grow tons of tomatoes and I'll buy my cabbages. Um, but so, so, you know, like, <laughs> I like my, my balance is always, uh, you know, how, how to do the thing that's going to be the most productive for me with my time and the growing things that are the easiest possible to grow are, are going to be really efficient. If you grow stuff that's easy to grow for you, then then it's easy to grow. Then you, <laughs> you know, you don't, it doesn't fail. You don't fight with it. You know, I, when I'm picking varieties, you know, I'm reading through the seed catalog and I'm, I'm looking for stuff that says, you know, here's one. And an exceptionally early beta alphate type. I'm like, okay, early, early means it's going to produce sooner for me. Oh, plants are very productive, both outdoor and in the greenhouse. You, like, these are all things that I'm like, okay, it's really early you know, because my season isn't, I don't have an eight month season. I only have, you know, like a six month season and it's, it's really productive. It means that, you know, maybe this, this cucumber is going to produce twice as many cucumbers as this cucumber. So to get, you know, to get the number of cucumbers I want, I only need to grow one plant instead of two. Um, you know, that's, that's always kind of my focus when, when I'm seed shopping and when I'm looking for stuff. Um, <clears throat> And even even more so now with, when it comes to like the farm, um, like I'm really focused on on um, like a seed pack. Like, OK, these William Dam seed packs are are easy to read. Hold this up for you guys. OK, so it's it has the days here, the days to maturity. And, and this, this is something that I'm really focused on, you know, basically what I'm looking for is I'm looking for like, what does this one say? Uh, you know, beta alpha, alpha type, which needs no pollination and contains few seeds. So I, like, I read that and I'm like, okay, that means that I'm not going to have, if this is in the greenhouse where not as many bugs are getting in, like not as many bees are getting into the greenhouse. I'm not going to have pollination issues on this. This is going to produce for me even, even in areas where, where, you know, there isn't as much like insect activity, you know, whereas if like I've, I've had issues with, um, <clears throat> the brain fart, uh, zucchinis because I've had issues of not getting enough, enough bees into the garden to get in to to pollinate my zucchinis there's too many other things that they get to before they get to my zucchinis um and then without pollination you don't get good production um so you know this it's like okay well this this i'll get good production on and then as i was saying it has like the day you know i'm when i'm shopping for the varieties that i want to be growing in the farm i'm looking at that day because, you know, there's only so much I can do with season extension, right? So it, like, you know, a cucumber needs heat, right? So there's, with having an unheated greenhouse, there's only so much that I can push, you know, a, a cucumber out, out of its normal outdoor growing season. You know, normally I, I plant cucumbers direct into the ground, you know, mid-May, end of May even. I'd wait for, you know, the soil to heat up. Um, in the greenhouse, I can go a little bit earlier because the soil is going to heat up a little bit earlier. Um, but, you know, I, if my first, if my last frost is, you know, early May, mid-May, I can't be planting this like in, in March. It's, it's not going to, it's not going to grow. So, um, and the other people around me who are farming, they have the same issue too. Unless they have a heated greenhouse and they're growing, you know, greenhouse cucumbers, they're going to be running into, into these issues also. But so the way that I get the cucumber earlier 
to you know beat everyone to market to have these cucumbers as early as possible because we all love cucumbers and the earlier I can get them to sell them the longer my selling season is you know the if I'm the first person at the farmer's market with cucumbers you know I'm I'm guaranteed to sell out of my cucumbers and maybe once they start buying my cucumbers they're going to they're going to you know always come back for my cucumbers so the the earlier i can get stuff the better it is for me as a business um yeah so then like this one it's 52 days to production and this one's 60 right so that means that even even if this cucumber is my favorite cucumber and and this cucumber is a really good cucumber this this is a tasty green this this is one of the varieties that i'm buying to grow for for our farm this year <clears throat> and actually this is this is also a variety that I'm buying to grow for our farm too. This is Diva. Um these are both like the flavor on these is amazing. Um these are short and fat and this is long and skinny. Um <clears throat> so Diva being 52 days is going to be ready at you know 8 days earlier than this one. That's like a whole week earlier and that that doesn't mean as much to me in in a home garden because you know i can wait i can wait a week to get a cucumber but <clears throat> those extra eight days means a, a really big difference for me when it comes to the farming um yeah so you know these are these are kind of like the things that i'm looking at when i'm when i'm looking at seeds when i'm when i'm seed shopping you know like the, i i'm not i haven't you know, there's a bunch of stuff that I've been growing forever. I know what I like. I know what I want. Um, cucumbers are something that I'm not super good at. So cucumbers are something that I actually was doing, you know, I was having a hard time picking what to buy um, this year. And, and that was kind of like a lot of my thought process. You know, I was like, what's going to be something that's disease resistant? You know, what's something that's going to be super productive? Because I only have so much space, I'm going to be putting these in my greenhouse. So you know, if they need a lot of pollination, that's something that that you know is is a consideration for me. Um, uh, you know, another thing too, here, like what? Yeah, the D the diva was a good price. Um, but I I was looking at some cucumbers and you know seeds. They were like a dollar twenty a seed. Like some of these, like you know, actual farming greenhouse seeds like they're they're super super expensive the seed you know it it makes sense because if you're gonna be growing you know if if like we we sell a cucumber at the market we'd probably sell them for two dollars or three for five um so you know i sell one cucumber and if you know if the seed costs me two bucks it just i sell one cucumber and i get the money back um <clears throat> but for doing like a seedling sale there's no world. <laughs> There's no world that I'm gonna, you know, buy those for a seedling sale. Because anyone who's doing a seedling sale, that like that that's that's not some anyone who's buying seedlings isn't being that picky about about their seeds, right? So, you know, the I did buy the the diva and the tasty green. That the price on this is low enough that I can do these as as like a seedling sale as like a good cucumber for me and also for other people to buy um but you know there's lots of stuff that I actually bought this year that I no one gets it but me because it's too expensive um you know and then there's other stuff like you know like just classic heirloom open pollinator stuff like this cucumber is market more and the seed on this is super cheap because it's it's easy to produce the seed on this. Um, and but this you know this is still this is still a really good cucumber and this is like a variety that people know and people like. Um, so this is actually like an excellent cucumber for me to buy to do seedling sales. Um, just you know because it's liked and it's cheap. So you know best best of both worlds everyone gets what they want it's the same as like an heirloom tomato the seed on heirloom tomatoes is is like really cheap um but it's it's what people want you know for for me to do a seedling sale um you know 50 cent tomato seed uh you know i'll still i'll still do that for the seedling sale or you know or the one cent heirloom tomato you know it you know but not the two dollar tomato seed not when I'm selling my seedlings for 250. <laughs>
That, and that's why I make no money on seedlings. Okay, other ones in here. I have this Eureka. This was a, a pickle cucumber. Um, I don't I don't grow pickle cucumber, so I don't actually know how this worked. But this was like kind of, you know, when I read the seed catalog, it was like, oh, the most liked. So I bought that for the seedling sales. Oh, I'm seeing uh, the walls on my greenhouse uh, do roll up. Um, but bees, you know, the bees are smart. They don't necessarily like bees don't fly into your house very often. Even if your windows are open, they're like, eh, that looks kind of sketchy. So it, it is hard to get pollination in a greenhouse, even with the sides up and everything. Um, and if you're getting stuff going early enough, um, you know, the bees won't really be out in numbers yet. Um, even when your plants are flowering inside a greenhouse and some people keep their greenhouses completely sealed to keep pests out. Um, so you have to actually like release pollinators into your greenhouses. And I like, I'm not going to do that. That's, I'm not a greenhouse grower. <laughs> um, here's another one that I like. I've grown this before. Merc, merc, bleh, mercury. Oh, wait, this one, this one was super funky. This is crystal apple. I, I really liked the look of it because there was these like <clears throat> round, round yellow, uh, cucumbers but the flavor was <laughs> really bad they they were super bitter and i'm bad at growing cucumbers so so i uh i maybe shouldn't grow that one to sell but people people did like to try it in their gardens um and for for bees we like we don't have any issues here because like our entire lawn in the spring is dandelions so you know the bees and our neighbors they they have beehives so we, we definitely we benefit from from our neighbors having having the bees and then the neighbors benefit from us having lots of food for the bees because you know we le we let the dandelions flower in the spring and then after the dandelions we have we have stuff growing so you know it's hopefully they keep having bees hopefully their beehives don't die because it's definitely been a, a very good uh, symbiotic relationship um Early Fortune. This is another uh, pickle cucumber. I keep it like a lot of this stuff I'll buy. Like that's that's part of the reason why I uh, why I'm so my rule for seed shopping. Oh, kittens here. Look at this bad kitten. Look at this bad kitten. Um, the my rule for seed shopping is I give myself one day a year to seed shop. I you know I I don't I don't like looking at seed catalogs. <clears throat> Because I, first of all, most of the time, they won't have absolutely everything in the seed catalog. And so I want to know what all my choices are. Because quite often seed companies will, they have to print their catalogs, you know, you know, months ahead of time. And quite often they'll pick up a few extra varieties that they didn't necessarily know they were going to be selling when they sent the seed catalog off to get printed. So I, and I, I shop online anyway, so I might as well just do it on the website. Um, so I go and I'll like, you know, I'll read through the website. I'll spend, you know, I'll spend a week or two researching. I'll decide. I get my, my mountain of seeds. I go through it. I see what I have. Um, so I'm not double buying things. Uh, and then I like, you know, I make a shopping cart and then I, <laughs> you know, I let it sit. I put like all, I try to be really restrained, make my shopping cart. I let it sit. I come back with my seeds. I go through all my all my leftover seeds, double check that I haven't double purchased something that I already have. Um, and then I, I also I go through all the different shopping carts to make sure that I'm not, you know, getting super excited about, you know, like one thing that I, I had way too much in my shopping carts this year. Um, was eggplants. I love eggplants. I'm obsessed with eggplants. So all the different companies that are shopping at, because I shop at William Dam Seeds, West Coast Seeds, and then Johnny Seeds. Um, at, like, and that's it. I, I don't, I don't want to shop at multiple places because I want to keep it. I just shop there because, oh, my cat. Oh, this kitten. <laughs> I have this fabric hung up and he's like literally climbing. He's climbing the wall. Oh, you bad cat. Anyways. <laughs> um, I So I have... I have... Yeah, I keep it narrowed in. I only shop at those places because... Basically, I do my first shop at William Dam because they have the best prices and they have a really good selection. And so I get everything I possibly can from there. And then I like West Coast Seeds because they have a bunch of like Asian vegetables. And then they have a few other things 
that I, I can't get. Um, and so then I do West Coast Seeds. Oh, and to put this into context too, I'm Canadian. So I do everything I possibly can not to shop in the States um, because because of exchange. Uh, our, our currency exchange is is 30% at least without like the, ow! Oh, this cat, I'm gonna murder him. You're being bad. You're being very bad. Um, yeah, so so basically like, you know, when I'm shopping at places in the States, um, they, you know, I have to add this huge amount of fee on. So there's there's never a time that it's not a better deal for me to just get it in Canada because of because of exchange. Oh. Okay, this kitten is determined to be bad. Um, yeah, and then and so basically the only reason why I shop at Johnny's is because I want Salanova. Um, I want the Salanova lettuce. So then if there's anything else that isn't isn't at um that wasn't at the at William Dam or at West Coast Seeds, at that point I then buy it from Johnny's because Johnny's has the Salanova and they're the only one, so I'm going there. So, you know, I bought I bought some specialty tomatoes from Johnny's. Um, because, like, you know, here's here's a perfect example. So the international shipping from Johnny's is a flat rate fee of $50. And then when you add the currency exchange, it's $65. So to buy from a place in the States, I'm tacking $65 on as shipping, right? So if it, even if there's a better price at high mowing on half the stuff, that I'm buying from Johnny's when you add in the the sixty five dollars that it costs to ship it, um, then it's you know it you're not saving any money. Um, yeah, for, for the flowers, I specifically only grow things that are super easy, and I do absolutely no post handling other than like I use fresh water and I you know I get them into a cool room. Um, we our outbuilding is usually not too bad, uh, but it did start to get really hot in the in the summer. So we we put an air conditioner into one of the rooms, and then I stored the flowers in there. Just you know, so I wasn't cooking them at like thirty degrees. Oh, this kitten is so bad. Look how bad this kitten is. He's like, seriously, why can't I just climb this curtain wall? Um, yeah. So, so as I was saying, I only shop from these places, uh, because because I want to keep my my seed obsession contained and then after I've made these shopping carts before I complete my shopping carts um I go and I look and the example that I was giving was this year I I was really obsessed with eggplants which is every year but you know my my obsession got the better of me and I had eggplants from every single every single seed company in my shopping cart and I know I'm not going to um yeah, it, it, you know, the free shipping in the States doesn't matter. Like, J Johnny says free shipping in the States, but no, not for me as a Canadian. And oh, man, my Johnny's order this year, oh, hurt my heart. I got, I had to pay a duty on it. So I had to pay an extra $75 when I picked it up from the, from the post office. So, you know, basically, like, you know, almost like 150 bucks just to, like, get it to me. Um, and that's why... <laughs> That's why I don't necessarily say what where to buy your seeds because where I'm buying my seeds is is a lot motivated on the fact that I'm I'm Canadian. Um yeah, so I try I keep all my seed shopping really really narrowed in. You know, at this point I'm sitting here and I'm like, "Oh, I forgot to mm, there's like this one thing and I was thinking and I should have bought it." Um and uh and it I, if I didn't then it wasn't meant to be. That's my opinion. It like, you know, I have all these seeds, you know, if, I, if there's one thing that I forgot, then I can do it next year. I can get it next year. If, if there's something that I forgot and I'm regretting, then, you know, it, like too bad. Like, <laughs> um, yeah. So, so that's, that's like what's, that's kind of the backstory on, on how I try, like, I, 
I know every year I do this and like people are like, oh my God, we the picture that I used for the thumbnail on here, Ian like posted it on Reddit to like make fun of me in a gardening group. And he's like, oh, my wife, like, <laughs> here's my crazy wife with all of her seeds. And everyone was like, what? What's wrong with this woman? <laughs> but like, you know, I am, I am trying like you know there there is a logic to this madness and and also like you know i grow like you know last year we sold like fourteen thousand dollars so you know even though i spent three thousand like and like there's still probably fifteen hundred dollars worth of seeds so like you know there's some context to it uh, my favorite variety of eggplant is traviata uh it's one of my issues with eggplant is our sh our season you know, ideally we need a little, like I need an extra month. <laughs> I need like frost come like at the end of October and heat in into October, which I don't have. Um, so I like Traviata because it does good production. Um, and it, it like, I get a good amount of production off of it. Um, but I'm super excited. Like, so I, when I went and was like, oh, like, narrow it down, get rid of all these eggplants, the eggplants that I did keep were these, like, uh, like high production, you know, like, you know, this is what farmers grow, Asian style uh, eggplants. That is, so they're like the long skinny ones, and there's like a purple one and then a stripey one. Um, and I got those from Johnny's, and I'm, I'm really excited to try them. Oh, how many different varieties of seeds? I don't know. Like, you know, I, like, I basically, I have everything because of the seedling sale, you know, like, every, like, you know, there's, there's tons of stuff, you know, like, like I just said, I don't grow like broccoli, cabbages and cauliflower, but like, here's my bag of broccoli, cabbages and cauliflower because I'm going to grow them for, for like the seedling sale, you know, and like, I, like, I don't necessarily even have anything to say in regards to, to these because I, I basically was like, I don't know what sounds like, what, what sounds like the most common, the most popular, um, you know, like for cauliflower, I bought like snow crown. Cause I was like, yeah, I don't know. That's like, that's the one that you see. So like, you know, I, I have all this stuff. I have these seeds, but you know, like this, this, these here are the, the things that I'm not necessarily super snobby about. I'm snobby enough to like make sure that I like read through and I buy the one that sounds like it's going to be the most like bolt tolerant because we, we basically go from like cool to super hot. Um, you know, like June hits and it's, it's hot. It's 30. It's like, it's way up there. And it goes like from like nice temperate spring to, to that hot. And so it's, it's the type of weather that's really bad for, for seed, for, you know, these kind of cooler weather things bolting. Yeah, we're, we're uh, Curtis Stone. Uh, so, so he has like the like urban farmer book. Um, yeah, and I was like, yeah, I'm buying that because it tells me like exactly what to buy. Like people are like, oh, well, you know, you got to consider your area and your zone and stuff. And I'm like, I don't. I just do exactly what Kurt did because he's like from here. We we know Kurt too. We've like, we've known him for like years and years. He's actually the reason why we do YouTube videos. He was like, you guys should do YouTube videos. Uh, for how we organize, how I organize my seeds. Uh, I talked about that at the beginning. But I will say it's probably not worth going back and looking at because um, it's it's not, you know, like th this is my system. <laughs> it's not a great system. Um, oh, tomatoes. I don't, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll see if we get to that. But like maybe I'll just do a video and I talk about tomatoes again. I did do... Uh, I did do a video a bit back, um, which was like a live video, um, where, where I, uh, I talked about tomatoes cause I grew, I grew like 46 varieties of tomatoes or something last year. And, and I basically last year I, I did a lot of experiments with like heirloom tomatoes cause I've always had to be really, really narrowed in on tomatoes cause th they're like the number one thing that we like grow and eat. We're, we're tomato based life forms is, is our joke. And like, literally like I, like right now I have a full size chest freezer that's filled with frozen tomatoes. Cause I was like, this is how many tomatoes I need. Um, so we really, really like tomatoes. 
Um, but yeah, so I, I did experiments with them last year. And, and so I did a whole video where I talk about like what I liked, what I didn't like out of those. Um, so I, if we get to it, basically, uh, I can sum up my tomato video with Grow Juliet. It's the best tomato ever. You don't need anything but Juliet, the variety of tomato. tomato. Basically, I don't know if you guys have heard of this like William Shakespeare guy, but he wrote this play and it's about how much I love Juliet tomatoes. And it gets a little sad at the end because I love Juliet so much that I actually die from loving her. Um, but yeah, clearly a love story for the ages. Grow Juliet tomatoes. Uh, that's that's all I have to say about tomatoes, pretty much. Um, I don't know anything about slugs because we're so dry that like they're they're not an issue. Um, other than like make make it less moist. Um, you know, we, I do get slugs sometimes in my rhubarb. And then my trick for that is I just make sure there's good airflow. Um, so yeah. And like in my lettuce, I maybe like would have gotten some like slugs or snails. Um, I like to grow things so they're touching because then they crowd out weeds. Um, but if you grow things so they're touching, then it creates a perfect, perfect spot for like slugs and snails. Um, I, I don't really have to fight it too much because we're dry, so it's it's hard for them to live. Um, but, you know, it's, you know, when it comes to pests, I'm, you know, in a home garden, you just kind of, yeah, pick them out, eat around it. Doesn't matter if there's holes in it. Um, you know, but I'm also like, well, you know, like whatever, if they get like a few of them. I only start worrying too much about pests if they're like completely decimating a crop. And then kind of like, as I said about the like brassicas, Usually my trick is I'm just like, I'll grow something else <laughs> that has less pests. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really not the the best person to get tips on, on that kind of stuff from because it I'm super lucky and I also, you know, I just, I try to make it as easy as possible by, by just not fighting them. Okay, so radishes. I'll talk about radishes. Uh, so I love radishes. They're my favorite. Um, the radishes that I'm going to grow for the farm are this one. It's icicle short top. Um, but there's like icicle basically is, is what I see. And it's a, it's a long skinny white radish and I love the flavor on it. It's, it's really sweet. Um, it's not a daikon. It's super fast. I think it's like 25 days to harvest. Um, but like really like crisp, juicy, sweet. Um, when you grow it in the summer, it gets heat, like all radishes, um, in the heat, they get spicy, but it's, it stays sweeter than most of my other ones. Yeah, I know this, this is, ah, I, I love these farm seeds. I mean, they, okay. So this is the most, if you want to talk about ridiculous, this is the most ridiculous. This is half a million carrots. <laughs> right there. <laughs> and, and what I learned is I do not need half a million carrots. This like, I don't, I don't even know what I'm going to do with this. I think I need to like give this away. I'm going to use this this year, but carrot seed, carrot seed is one of those ones that does have, have like a pretty short shelf life. Um, so, you know, I had this from last year and, and this, so I might as well tell you, uh, this is Scarlet Nance. Um, this, this is super cheap. These, these carrot seeds, this is like, you know, classic heirloom. Uh, the, the seeds really cheap. So I think I think I bought the size just because the price was so good on it that I didn't really, I didn't really realize that it, uh, it was, it was going to be this much, <laughs> um, for thinning. I don't, I don't thin carrots. I, you know, I have a cedar. I, I was using the earthway last year. Uh, this year we bought the Jang cedar. So it's a, it's like a more precise cedar and I seed them heavy but I seed them heavy because I'm selling them as like a, a small to medium sized carrot. Um, a Jang seeder, it's, it's like a, it's, you dump seeds in it and it's like a little, you know, like it has wheels and it drops, it drops seeds down into the dirt. So, you know, instead of like being out there and like, ding, 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 like you know, taking forever, like you feel that like dump my seeds into it and do, 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 go for a little walk every like row. I just like up, down, up, down takes like, no time. Um, I, I would not be able to do the farm if I didn't have a cedar. It's like, you know, like it would take all day to seed the beds. 
Um, yeah, but so Scarlet Nance, super cheap, classic heirloom. The flavor on this, uh, like, was amazing. And it, so, here. Okay, I'll interrupt radishes and I'll talk carrots because I literally have goldfish brain, so. <laughs> um, everything that I can sow, like, from seed, I'll, I'll do. I just got the Jang, so I need to, I need to buy the wheels for it. Um, but it sounds like from what people say, um, they use the Jang for everything except for spinach. Um, and I might like for, I, cause I have the earth way. Um, I, I might, um, I might use the earth way still for sunflowers. Just the, the wheels for the Jang cedar, they're, they're a little pricey. Um, and you need to get like a wheel for every crop and then you have to change it in and out and everything. So I might just keep the earthway cedar for my bigger seeds because I don't have too many of them. You know, I'm not, I'm not like a corn farmer or anything. So, you know, if I, if I have the jing for the, the smaller, more precision stuff, sorry, um, like the carrots and, you know, I tried using the earthway for a bunch of like Asian vegetables that have like a smaller seed <coughs> and did a really bad job. Um, so that, that was, you know, I, it, overall I was really happy with the earthway. I'd say the earthway is worth the money. I'm, I've been thinking of maybe doing like a updated earthway review. Um, yeah. And it's, you know, it, it was surprising. It was a surprisingly good tool for the price. Um, but it, the, the Jang cedar, you know, but like by the time I like buy it and all the accessories, it's going to cost me like a thousand dollars. Um, and, but it, it's, it's going to be worth the extra money for, cause if like someone said, like, oh, you know, like to see you seed all those carrots, like exactly if I had to, or sorry, uh, thin all the carrots, if I had to thin the carrots, like there'd be no point in growing carrots. It takes so long. So, you know, if, if the Jang will plant the carrots perfectly, um, then, then not having to to thin anything is, is worth all the money in the world. <laughs> um, okay. So carrots. So I grew this Scarlet Nance. This was amazing. Um, my customers like were coming back again and again and again and loving this. I planted these quite dense, so they never got very big. They, they stayed like a nice small to medium sized carrot, which is like perfect for, you know, the snacking size carrot, which is like what my customers want. Um, and these, like, these are the ones that are still out in the field. Like they're holding in the field, still super sweet, super nice. Um, so yeah, I'm super, super happy with this because it's like such a cheap classic heirloom. Um, I, you know, I have to, I have to use this up. So I'm growing it again this year. Um, but I also bought Mocum. So I, I have some of this left over from last year. And then I bought more Mocum again, and it is kind of similar to, to, um, to the Scarlet Ants. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm going to grow it the same way. The reason why I'm not only growing Scarlet Ants, the reason why I've like spent, you know, $25 on, on more, you know, cause this'll do $25, like 10,000 seeds. This'll probably do two beds. And I bought, I, I think I bought another pack, maybe, yeah, I can't remember. I don't know if I bought this size pack or if I bought a bigger size pack, uh, cause carrots did so well that I, I'm going to go, I'm going to go with the carrots heavy again. Um, but so this is 50 days to, to harvest or 36 days to a baby carrot, whereas Scarlet Nance was like 70 or 72. Right. So like going back to, uh, going back to what I was saying about, um, what was I talking about? The cucumbers where I said that, you know, it made this huge difference for me to market the eight days between, you know, an early cucumber and like, you know, a normal cucumber getting those extra eight days earlier 
could mean the difference between me selling a million cucumbers and me selling like hardly any cucumbers. Same with carrots. Um, and for there to be like 20 days, 20 plus days of a difference between harvest dates on these is like that, that is massive. That's, that is a reason why no one else grows these Scarlet Nance carrots. Cause it doesn't matter how cheap this pack of carrots was. Um, and it doesn't matter how expensive this pack of carrots was, you know, I, I could do two rounds of baby carrots to the amount of time it's going to take in the field for for these carrots um so that like you know the seed the seed isn't the seed isn't the seed price isn't a concern um my plan is that i'm gonna april 1st i'm gonna go outside i'm gonna get my jang cedar i'm gonna load it up i'm gonna plant a bed of scarlet nance i'm gonna plant a bed of mocum and then the reason why that works is Mocum will be ready at you know, 50 days and then I can sell Mocum. I can sell that bed of carrots for, you know, two, three weeks. And then Scarlet Nance will be ready. Like, and so I can plant these on the exact same day and have a staggered harvest on them. So I can still get to market early with carrots but I can still, like, I was really happy with these in the heat of the summer and everything. So, you know, I can do that and then, and then see how that goes. So, you know, they're, that's, that's what's going on with carrots. Um, another thing that if you guys were here from before, you would have heard me talk a bunch about is I did rainbow carrots. I, this is like a rainbow blend. And then this is purple sun. Um, and these, these are purple on the inside. So a lot of the purple carrots that that people do are purple on the outside and then orange on the inside. Um, this one's like the super, super dark purple. That's, that's why I bought it. Um, these, I'm going to use this up. This is like enough, this is probably enough seed for like a bed or a bed and a half of carrots. I didn't buy any more of the rainbow carrots because I, I didn't like them. They take like a super long time to grow and they were like I like the rainbow blend was really inconsistent like the the yellow got massive but then you know the the white was still tiny like they didn't they didn't grow at an even they're supposed to grow at an even rate that's why they're blended together but they still didn't and then this purple one this like it took forever like it, it like and it never did anything it never never got big um so, and, and then when I went to market with these, I thought like, oh, people are going to be super excited. They look so cool. They look so funky. Everyone's going to snap these up. This is going to, you know, people are going to come running to my market stand because they want to get these colored carrots. But everyone like was like, no way. I don't, I don't care what they look like. These Scarlet Nants are so delicious. All I want are these Scarlet Nants. So people basically, so we were selling the carrots $3 or two for five. And people were buying two bunches of the Scarlet Nance for the $5. And then when I started going with the Rainbow Carrots, um, it wasn't like we converted any new customers that were buying the, buying like not buying my orange carrots to start buying carrots. The only thing that happened were people like, were like, well, I know I love these. So may this week I'm going to experiment with my second bunch being these purple and colored ones because they're fun. Like no one, we didn't get new customers and the labor to grow these was like way more than growing the orange carrots. So like, why would I do the extra work if the, if the customers like aren't excited about it? So I'll probably do a bed of it into for the fall, just because by the fall when it comes, I'm not going to have a, like a lot of the color and all the fun, exciting things of the, of the summer, you know, like even the flowers, the flowers will be done in the fall. Um, so basically I can have these colored carrots to, to beautify my farmer's market stand um, when, when some of my funner stuff disappears, but yeah, rainbow carrots, you know, they, they didn't taste as good. That's, you know, that's kind of what it came down to. They're harder to grow um, and they didn't taste as good. And, you know, that's two pretty big, 
pretty big knocks <laughs> against them. You know, if they like tasted as good and they were harder to grow and, and cool, then, you know, it's, it'd be more of a balance, but not as tasty and a pain in the butt. Like that's, that's like a guaranteed recipe for getting on the no grow list at my house. You know, hard and, and like not the right flavor. I, I, you know, I don't, I don't care that much about colors. I'm, my number one priority is like good production, good, good flavor. Um, yeah. Okay. So radishes. So as I was saying, white icicle, I love it. I love all these like long skinny radishes. Um, I, I got really into like long skinny things to grow because at my old garden, I was like really limited. I had 2000 square feet. That was it. <laughs> so my way to increase my like volume of production was to go like vertical. So, you know, grow things on trellises. Like, like I was saying earlier with the pumpkins, like grow, I grew my pumpkins over a fence and like, so they were on this vertical space. But the other way that I went vertical is I grew long skinny roots. So you know, I never grew carrots at my old place because I didn't like, well, I mean, now I should have never grown carrots. I'm spoiled now. I was like, oh, whatever carrots, you can get them at the grocery store. Now that I've gotten used to homegrown carrots. The flavor is so good that I can't go back to grocery store carrots. Um, but yeah, at my old place, I just, I didn't have the space to give it. Um, but yeah, so my radishes, cause I love radishes. So they for sure got a spot. I'd grow the long skinny ones. So like white ice school, long and skinny. Um, the other one that I did is a uh, French breakfast. It's a long skinny red one. And then it has a little white tip. And I really love the flavor and it's, it's super early. It's like a 25 day variety too. So it's nice and fast, like in and out in a couple weeks. Um, but yeah, so, you know, if you grow the round root, you know, you, you, they, you only get so much, right? Like they're, you know, in the ground, but if you grow the long skinny roots, you can grow them closer, you know, and then you get more. Um, and then the other root that we grew was beets because we love beets. We're obsessed with beets and we always grew a, a cylindrical beet for the exact same reason, you know, like a round beet, like it only gets so big, right? Cause it, it's friend is beside it. Right. So you can't grow past where it's friend is pushing it, but growing like the vertical beets, you get more, you get more volume to square footage of your garden. So when it came to beets here, let's see. I have a big pack. This is, here's, here's an heirloom that I love more than, uh, that I love more than, than a hybrid. Um, this, this is Solyndra and I love this beet. This, this is like my number one favorite beet. I love the flavor on it. It's, you know, it's not like, it's not sugar sweet. It, it has some of those earthy flavors, but it's still like really sweet and stays tender. And, um, I also, I really liked it for, um, you know, like the, the shape of it, if I was going to can beets, instead of doing baby beets, you do these cylindrical beets and you do slices and then they fit really nicely in, in the can. And they also, they cooked really uniformly because of the shape. So instead of doing cubes and, you know, like sometimes the corners of the, the round cube are smaller and then some are bigger, we we just do like the rings of this to slice it to then to steam them to eat. And so they cooked super evenly and, you know, it's yeah. So Solyndra, this, this is my, this is my favorite beet and we're growing it here now. Um, most like, you know, what I was growing because of like my square footage concerns that like, that's not so much of a concern anymore because I have more space. Um, now I'm kind of, I'm working in like, instead of working in volume, like, so in, in, when I had a 2000 square foot garden, the most important thing to me was the volume that I could produce in that space. So like I was saying, I was doing all this vertical. Um, and now at the farm, one of my biggest concerns is like time space. So like what I've been talking about, like with the carrots, right? Like getting the carrot that produces 20 days earlier. So it's out and then something new is in, you know, because I pull, you know, in, in my home garden, I'd plant a patch of beets, 
And then I wasn't pulling all the beets out. I wasn't harvesting all the beets the moment they were ready because it was for us to eat, right? So so when, like, I'd plant these and then, you know, we'd, we'd go and pick a handful of beets for a meal. And so I'd have this small section and it had a really good volume because I did the vertical beets. Um, so I got lots out of it, but they were there. They were there for me to pick. Um, and then, but now it's different, right? Because now the second my beets are ready, I pull them out. It Like, I don't have to, I don't have to worry about, about like, you know, slowly eating through my bed of beets because I pull it out and I sell it and it's gone. And then I plant something new into that space. So, um, you know, if, if I grow these Solyndra vertical beets, but they don't sell at the farmer's market, then they're, they're a problem, <laughs> even though I have more volume of them than like, a, like, here's another beet, than a red ace beet, which is a round beet. So I'm not gonna get as many roots per bed but if Red Ace is the, is the variety that people want to buy at the farmer's market, um, then, then if I grow this, I can rip out an entire bed and sell it and then replant it. So then, you know, that, that, that square footage ha is getting more produced out of it because of that time aspect than if, than if I grew Solyndra and it took me an entire season to sell the bed of Solyndra, even though I could grow double the roots, um, it growing double the roots, but it having the only thing that I grow in that space is more of an issue than me growing, having to grow two successions of Red Ace, which, you know, it's 57 days. So I planted April 1st and I get my first harvest on it in June. And then I plant it again and there's roots coming out in September. And then I'm planting in kale for, you know, or something to overwinter that I harvest early the next year. So there's actually three things that are coming out. Um, that means that Red Ace is giving me the most production, even, even though it doesn't give me the most volume. I, so so that's that's kind of the the thought the so that 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 right there sums up uh why I've been hurting my head a little bit trying to learn the difference between home gardening to farming um so so yeah so the the um just the the way that I that I have to think about things is is totally different now than it was before um even though it's it's still the same it's still the same idea which is finding the way to produce the most in the amount of space you know i mean it's it's pretty incredible to me like you know last year was our first year farming and the the amount because so our our farm we it's only the main farm section was only 4,000 square feet. And then the, then the farm, the flower farm was a thousand square feet. And then probably when I added up all my like greenhouses and then I had this like little garlic section and you know, like I had bits and pieces planted everywhere, you know, that maybe added up to another 3,000 square feet. So, you know, it's like maybe, maybe I was growing in 8,000 square feet and the amount that I grew uh, was like, was insane, right? Like the, the amount of food that I was able to get, to get out of there was, was really incredible. Yeah, so like, I, I'm just kind of seeing what you're saying there. So the backstory is I've had like a vegetable garden forever. <laughs> I had my first, I had my first vegetable garden when I was in university and I, I had, I had a community garden plot. Um, so I, I've been like, I've been having like my own home garden for years and years and years. And, and that's the reason why, like at this point I am like a bit of like a seed snob and you know, like why I'm kind of like, you know, like I, I've been saying over and over again, it, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter like the exact seed that I bought. Right. You know, like I can go through the, 
all the seeds that I have in here, even though like, you know, I'm at an hour and a half and like literally I've talked about barely anything, <laughs> uh, like in regards to like the actual seed packs. Um, but I, I kind of feel like it, it doesn't matter what I grow, right? Like, it, it, like it doesn't matter what I grow because unless you are my neighbors, uh, it, it's, it's not going to be exactly transferable. Um, I think it's, it's the, it's the, um, the logic, it's, it's the thought process behind what you're trying to do that then dictates like what you buy when it comes to, when it comes to seed shopping. Um, so, you know, that's why, like, I think at a certain point explaining what I'm thinking about when I'm picking my varieties is, is more important because, you know, like you guys are talking about with me a bit and I'm like saying, well, I don't have answers. You know, like I have different pest issues. I have different disease issues, my dates to maturity. And then, you know, and then the biggest complication of all, if I was going to give you a list of seeds to buy is I'm in Canada. I don't necessarily think that you should like, you know, in the same way, I don't want to deal with the customs of buying seeds to cross the border. Like, you know, I, I don't even think William Dam sells to the States. Like it's, it's really complicated for the, the cross border stuff. So, um, you know, it, I know that a lot of you guys are first time like gardeners. And so, you know, it, it's, you kind of need, like, it, you need that, like, just like really simple list. Right. So to be like, what, like, carrot I want to grow carrot what like what do I buy um you know that that's the hardest that's the hardest time and uh and so you know and that's why you know I said earlier um sometimes just going and buying those garden uh the the, the dollar store seeds at you know the the single rack that has you know the 15 different varieties of seeds you know that the very first garden I had so I had a community garden plot you know, it, in I went to university, I was in a new town and I got a community, community garden because I wanted to, I wanted to get some like cheap food and, you know, I knew enough about growing. My mom would like, my mom's like a really big, she, like, she's always been a big gardener, but not a food gardener. She's like been really into flowers and everything. So she's actually been a great resource to me because I'm only just learning about growing flowers like this past, this past year or two. Um, but you know, I've like, I had the, I knew how to grow things from being around my mom. Um, but I didn't care about flowers. I wanted to get some free food. <laughs> so I got a community garden plot and I had no money. <laughs> I had to, there was a guy who came and for 50 bucks, he'd rototill your community garden plot, which, you know, was an amazing deal because the community gardens were, they were a thousand square feet. They were massive. And it was my first garden. So I didn't even know that that was massive. I didn't know that that was like, you know, an overwhelming amount of, of stuff to grow. Um, but I didn't have $50. So like me and my boyfriend went with, with like a shovel and we hand turned like the entire community garden plot because it had been overgrown with weeds for multiple years. So it, you know, it needed, needed some work. Um, and then I went to the dollar store and I had like a $20 budget and I bought 20 bucks worth of dollar store seeds. And that's what I took down to like my community garden and I planted out and, you know, and it, some of it failed, you know, some of it grew and I had more food than I knew what to do with because, you know, if you plant an entire pack of, of, uh, even those tiny little dollar store, like seed packs, if you if plant an entire pack of, that it gives you a lot of food if it works out um you know and you know it i just gone from there right like the the place that i had my community garden was in victoria um so it's like coastal temperate um you know if you want to have issues with slugs that's that's a good spot to have issues with slugs but if you want to grow swiss chard year round if, like swiss chard's a perennial there um you know, I, I was like, oh, I know about growing tomatoes because my mom would always have a tomato plant. You know, I planted a tomato plant. It got blight. I was like, I don't I don't know what's going on with this tomato. I've never heard of blight before because we don't have that here. You know, so it like, you know, you learn all these things 
the the most valuable lessons I've ever gotten from my garden are from the failures that I've had. So, sorry, one second. Yeah, so, you know, the, like, people are always, like, a lot of new gardeners are always really worried that they'll they'll do this and nothing will work out. They'll plant this garden and nothing will work out. And like, you know, obviously don't don't spend money that you can't afford, right? Like on a garden. Be like if if you're like I like I have ten dollars and I like, you know, that's my food budget for the week. So you know, I'm going to spend it on seeds, but then I'm going to starve for this week. And if I don't get any food out of this, it's going to, you know, be a very, very big issue. Like, don't do that. Like, you know, like that in that case, like do some, do a lot of research, make sure that those $10 of seeds that you're getting is, is going to, going to work out. But, um, you know, for, for me to spend $10 on seed and to have a garden and absolutely everything fail, um, is the best ten dollar education you'll you'll ever you'll ever get, because you know you can you can listen to me talk for an hour and a half on and on and on about about seeds, but in you'll never learn as much as you'll learn going out and having a garden that completely fails. Because if your garden goes out, it completely fails. Nothing grows. Like you've learned like a super super valuable lesson. You've almost learned a better lesson than if your garden thrived. Because when your garden fails, you learned what will make a garden fail, right? Like sometimes like you you have all this success in a garden, but you don't actually know what it is specifically that you're doing that's successful, right? So anytime something fails, it's that that's a great lesson because you've just learned something that you can't do, right? Where Where, you know, a lot of this stuff is, you know, I can do something year after year after year and I and I'm like oh it's well it's working like this thing's growing great I must be doing something right um but you know it's it's not actually what I'm doing that is 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 doing something right it's you know it's it's working out it's only it's only when you do something that directly correlates to it failing that you actually learn what like what was what what was the line of what works and what was the line of what doesn't work so yeah, yeah, it's, it's hard when you're a brand new gardener and you know, all this stuff that I'm talking about, about like how to maximize your space and you know, how, how to pick specific varieties out of the seed catalog. That's, that's kind of like, you know, like, like I tell Ian that I'm like, I don't really know how to tell someone like how to start. All I can do is tell the person who's like had the garden for three years, how to like do a little bit better, how to get to like that, that next level. It's like, okay, so you know how to, you know how to grow like radish. Now let's like, now, now let's like take our radish game to the next level. Right. And, you know, and the other thing too, is I think for me personally, the, the most valuable thing that I have in knowing, in learning and knowing about my garden is, is knowing what my goals are with the garden. So, you know, like with, when I had my, my big garden in my backyard, my goal was to grow the most amount of food that I could. And I, my garden was maxed out. I had my entire backyard, you know, I had a little strip of grass. Ian said I wasn't allowed to take all the grass. But like I took as much of the grass as I possibly could. You know, we transformed the front yard into like perennials and stuff. Like it was like, okay, I'm gonna this is the space that I have to work with. I'm gonna maximize my space for the maximum production. Because I want to grow the most amount of food that I can possibly get for myself. I want to, you know, feed myself as much as possible out of my out of my space, right? So because I knew that was what I was trying to achieve you know, it, it then made it so all the decisions that I made, you know, following that, like, you know, it just logically lined up. It was like, okay, well, I want to maximize my production. So, you know, the going vertical with the vertical roots, right? Like, I want, I want to maximize my, you know, another aspect of it is that um, I wanted to maximize my value. Um, 
So I didn't grow carrots for that reason. And like potatoes, like there's another crop that, you know, we, we grew some this last year because we had space and, you know, homegrown potatoes are amazing. <laughs> you don't know how good homegrown potatoes are until you have them. And then you're like, wow, the, like that doesn't taste anything like a grocery store tomato. Like fresh potatoes are really good. Um, but yeah, I didn't grow that stuff because it was a low value crop. So, and it was something that's always available, you know, at a good price in the grocery store. But we grew tons of tomatoes because getting good, fresh, homegrown tomatoes is, you know, like amazing and super expensive. Um, yeah, so we grew tons of tomatoes in the garden, but we didn't grow carrots, right? So we could have, we could have chosen to grow less tomatoes like half the, half a bed of tomatoes and half a bed of carrots and had a bit of this for fresh eating but rather than that we you know we wanted to save the money that we would have spent on good you know farmers market tomatoes by growing them ourselves so that we had the flavor and everything so growing a huge number of tomatoes made sense in the in the value aspect right like it was like a high high value crop um you know, same as we, we don't eat, like, you know, this last year we ate a ton of lettuce because we've been, we were, you know, people want to buy lettuce. So we grew a lot of lettuce to be able to sell it, but we never grew a lot of lettuce in our home garden because we don't, we don't eat a lot of lettuce. We'd rather eat, we'd rather eat a tomato salad than eat a lettuce salad. Um, so, you know, we never bothered giving, giving the garden space for lettuce because there was other things that we'd rather eat. Um, but you know, all, all those decisions came out of like our goals, right? Um, whereas other people, their goal is to be able to, you know, like lots of people like have a vegetable garden for like therapy purposes and, you know, they're like, oh, I want it to look beautiful. So it's, you know, half of it's planted with flowers and the other half is planted in the, you know, these purple carrots that I don't want to grow because they're like, I can't buy this in the grocery store. And like, you know, it fills my heart to go out to the garden, surrounded by flowers and pull up these purple carrots. And, you know, it's about this like experience of being in the garden and having these fun and unique things, you know, and so then, then your seed choices are gonna, are gonna stem from from that being your goal, right? How how you design your personal garden. Like for me, the only flowers that I had in my 2000 square foot garden was I had a strip of perennial flowers along the front of my garden and that were that grew really tall. I had a bunch of like really tall bee balm and like a few other things like you know, someone earlier was like, oh, borage will bring the bees in. I grew a handful of things specifically just to get bees to come in to pollinate my plants. I like the, the my flowers were 100 percent functional. I did not care about the flowers at all. They were just there to like be beacons for pollinators to get into the garden, you know, so so you know, that, like, those decisions were, you know, like, a lot of people are like, oh, that's crazy, like, why would you do that, right, and so how you, how you design your garden, like, has to come out from, like, what, what you want to get, so, you know, sometimes it, it's almost, it's a little bit more beneficial to, like, take some time, decide what you want the garden to do for you, you know, even, like, even if you have to, like, think about it for a week, like that's that's better research than reading through hundreds of different varieties to to try to decide like the varieties that you want you know so yeah <laughs> okay should we talk seeds again okay let's see what we got in here how about kale do you guys like kale that was something but i grew a couple always but kale I like kale in the winter to eat, but there's definitely better things to eat in the in the summer than kale. Like tomatoes. All you need is tomatoes, pretty much. <laughs> oh, here. Before we finish, for radishes. This is Easter egg radishes. Everyone's obsessed with these. I don't know why. I don't like these. These radishes. This like this this is like the the rainbow carrot blend. 
they didn't grow evenly. The white ones would like get like they'd be all they would bolt in the heat and then the purple ones would get massive and the red ones would be small. Um, I don't like this Easter egg mix. For this coming year I bought I bought just like a purple one because that was basically the only thing that I liked out of the the Easter egg mix but yeah I mean you know my mom thinks these are the best radishes ever and this is the only radish that she'll grow but and I know that people at the farmer's market like them but yeah I don't know I, maybe I'm just bad at growing it but yeah okay so here like you guys will laugh at me on this this is part of what's going on in my my seed collection here these are like aspirational seeds because these like these never even got opened <laughs> this is like <laughs> this is the reason why oh for the customers they want the the bagged salad for sure <laughs> we like you know we always laughed because uh the like you know we we would like things to be more zero waste and so we have customers like all the time who are like yeah like i'd love to get a zero waste salad mix and we're like oh we sell zero waste salad mix it's like right here it's called head lettuce like it comes with no packaging and they're like well yeah but it, like i i don't want to do the work of, like chopping up the head of lettuce and washing it they're like i want you to like wash it for me I'm like, well, you should probably still like wash it. I'm like, I did a really good job of washing it. I'm like, I don't rewash it, but you know, like how much do you trust me? <laughs> you know, you shouldn't trust anyone that much <laughs> to like, you know, not wash the veggies. Yeah. Like I, I'm, I'm pretty trustworthy. I, I clearly have a trustworthy face, but I'm also very food safe paranoid. Um, so I don't want to poison anyone. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like people, people basically, um the people want snack food so even though i'm selling veggies at the farmer's market people want like veggie snack food so salad mix is you know you dump it in a bowl it's snack food so it's like the carrots like people don't want big oversized carrots they want the baby carrots because they they're eating them raw um one of the things that you know, i'd forgotten about it and then i saw like i watched one of my videos again and, uh, <clears throat> yeah, well, I mean, honestly, plastic is great. You know, like plastic does serve its purpose. It's, it's hard, you know, we, our farmer's market is, you know, in the, in the afternoon on like, it's a Friday afternoon. So we're like hottest time of the day, you know, it's 35 degrees. We're down at the farmer's market and the, the lettuce in the salad the salad mix in the bags it keeps super good and it keeps for two weeks in the fridge so you know it's just it would be nice if then it was like a reusable plastic but you know like i had people be like oh pack it in paper and i'm like you know i might as well just pre-cook it <laughs> i'm like i don't think anyone wants like stir-fried lettuce you know like the the head lettuce like we have tricks to be able to keep it but you know, you know, and it, it's like the clamshells, like, like plastic doesn't get recycled anymore. So it doesn't matter if the, if the plastic clamshells can, can go in the recycling, if they're going to end up at the dump too, you know, technically it's better for the environment if it's like a thin plastic bag than if it's a big, heavy, um, plastic clamshell, you know, it's, it's super hard. It's a super hard thing, right? You know, we, we'd like to work with the customers to be able to get them, um, get them salad mix with, without using a plastic bag, right? Like we know that people want, we know that people want the salad mix, not the head lettuce. Um, well, you know, it doesn't matter if it's made out of plants, right? Like, you know, it's it like, you know, another, another thing like is it's, it's like those plastic water bottles that are made out of trees. You know, it kind of doesn't matter if like the the source is what the source is. Plastic is plastic, you know, and it, I, I'm definitely of the opinion that the that, you know, there's a lot of greenwashing going on when it comes to those biodegradable plastics. Right. It's yeah. You know, and exactly uh, if people bring their own containers and we have like a bulk a bulk 
bin that we have, you know, like a, like a food safe, um, like, uh, tongs to fill people's containers with, um, you know, I, I think that's, I think that's the best solution because when, when we wash and harvest stuff, um, you know, it goes, it goes into reusable bulk bins. Um, you know, like there's, there's a lot of research that says that the biodegradable plastics aren't actually like truly biodegradable. You know, it's, you know, it, it, it like, it's, it's super hard, right? Cause people, people don't want to be polluting with plastic, but you know, plastic, plastic is like a wonder material, you know, my, like, you know, Ian and I are super interested in, in like zero waste stuff. You know, we want to do the, the best, the best that we can. Um, you know, I think, I think the issue, like my personal opinion is the issue is single use. It, it's not plastic, you know, there's, a, there's nothing wrong with plastic. Um, it's, it's the fact that, we like live in this like disposable culture right where where we can you know we can put in all this effort to create something that is is just used to be garbage right it's like for for the amount of use that you get you might as well like start like you know a plastic bag company and all you do is make plastic bags and ship them straight to the dump you know like that's that's basically the function that, that we get out of all these single use items. And, you know, the flip side of it is, so what, we don't, we don't use plastic, but we use single use metal, we use single use wood, we use single use this and that, you know, uh, you know, the, it's, it's scary when you start to like, I, Ian and I are all like, <laughs> you know, we're running out of metal, we're running out of sand, you know, like we're, we're running out the, you know, the consumption, the rates of consumption are like scary, right? Like, you know, every, every time you look, you hear stories about like, oh, we're running out of, you know, easily used this or that, right? Like we're running out of helium. What are we going to do? We need it for all these medical supplies. And it's like, well, whoa, we use it as this like single use thing where we put it into a piece of plastic and send it into the air. You know, it's, you know, it, single use glass is, is, you know, like it's, it's as much of a problem as single use plastic, right? It's, you know, when, the, when there's absolutely no cost to packaging, right? Like when packaging costs nothing, so you don't need to actually even think about it as a business, um, you know, and you don't need to think about it as, as a customer, then that's the issue, you know? I'm I'm kind of pessimistic. I think I think the only solution is for everything to be like stupidly expensive. Once everything is stupidly expensive, then there's consequences to it, right? You know, if if it costs an extra dollar to have something come in a plastic bag, you know, that the dollars add up. But when it costs a cent like a fraction of a cent, you know, but you know, how how do you make it expensive? You know, <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm, I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part to make things expensive by selling really expensive local produce. <laughs> I'm doing my part to, uh, to, uh, readjust, uh, the economic values of, uh, of, um, of, of the way things should be, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm making food more valuable. <laughs> that's, that's what I always say, you know, <laughs> but yeah, it, it's, it's, it's an impossible, there's lots of easy solutions, but then once you start to look into the easy solutions, it, it, it becomes so nuanced that it's, you know, it's, it's really, it's really hard. It's, you know, like, I, I don't, we, like, Ian and I personally don't want to be, you know, greenwashing anything, you know, like one of, one of the biggest biggest things that was like a real eye opener for us in like starting the farm is we don't think we've ever bought so much plastic in, in like a single year, just because, you know, there's so much plastic involved in the farming and, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to prioritize decisions that aren't single use plastic. You know, we're, you know, we're, there's these, 
biodegradable plastic mulches that you can get and you can put down and it's they cost nothing it's so cheap and they work really great to make it so that you can like save this huge amount of labor um but you know and then it just it breaks apart in these tiny little bits of plastic um you know like we, we don't want to do that but you know we've been battling this like super nasty grass that you know basically it's just like impossible to to hand weed out you know we will be battling it still for a couple more years so you know we've invested into some landscape fabric for it and you know it's a product that will last five to ten years you know but it's you know it's plastic <laughs> so last year i made 1800 <laughs> paper pots <laughs> we did all of our seedlings in in paper pots um so <laughs> i like i find making the pots like super easy i i can do 100 an hour while watching tv for like rolling the paper pots like like i slam through them like really fast the thing that's like takes forever is like potting like transplanting up the paper pots um just because they're they're a little bit delicate but but yeah yeah i i know <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know all about the paper pots. That's in the, like, that's part of the video that I did, uh, like, talking about just how long it took. Yeah, I, you know, I love the Salanova. The Salanova is, like, blows my mind how good it is. Like, my Salanova was, like, survive. Like, I picked the last of it because we were, we are going to get down to, um, we got down to like minus 30. It was saying maybe even it was going to be minus 40. Um, but uh, yeah, the the Salanova out there, like I went and picked out whatever I could get. Um, it, it had like, it was fine. It was like, it had been like frozen to like minus 15. And it was like, oh yeah, like I'm, I'm growing. And then it was like, oh, it's like 40 degrees. And like, I forgot to water you for two days in the summer and the Salanova's like, yeah, I'm still here. I'm still fine. And then we'd pick these heads of lettuce. We'd like pick them. We'd bring them to the farmer's market. We'd like sit them in the sun at like the five o'clock sun beating down on it. Like, you know, and it would be like, like wilt. And we'd be like, oh, I don't know. We'd like take it. We throw it in the cooler and like half an hour later, oh, like beautiful lettuce, like super sweet. And we had customers telling us that because our salad mix was Salanova, they'd come and they'd be like, yeah, I found a bag of the salad mix that I bought from you, like in the back of my fridge. It was like three weeks old. They're like, and it was like still super good. Like it was still fine. It wasn't like no bad pieces at all. And it was still super tasty. So, you know, the, the, the reason why I oh, cut out, I don't know if it's, it's still gone. Um, yeah, so the only place you can get Salanova is from Johnny Seeds. I'm pretty sure they ship it internationally. Um, it's super expensive, <laughs> but I'm, you know, like it blows my mind, it blows my mind how good it is. Um, I'm, you know, I wish it wasn't so expensive. I wish I didn't have to buy it from Johnny's. I wish like, you know, I could buy it in Canada so I didn't have to like fuss with the, all the you know, hassle of the, the expensive shipping and like the customs and everything, but, um, it's worth all the money. It's, it's amazing stuff. Yeah. I mean, like it, some, some people, some people don't like it, but you know, <laughs> um, okay, here, I have this thing in my hand. <laughs> I'll explain what's going on here. And then uh, honestly, I'll probably like, if you guys have any more questions, I'll answer them. But I, I don't know if it's really worth, like, going through specific stuff. Um, I might. So what I'm going to do is when my new seeds come in, I'll, I'll talk about, like, what I have. Um, and then, you know, there's some stuff, like, you know, I have some hot peppers. Like, maybe, maybe I'll bring those out and I'll talk about them. I bought a bunch of my uh, hot peppers, I think, from, from uh, West Coast Seeds. And that's a pretty small order. Um, but, uh, yeah, so maybe I'll pull out some of my hot peppers and I'll like talk about that in, in that, but I think I'll probably like my seeds are going to slowly come, come in. So I'll probably do like every, every week this, these Wednesdays are a really good time for me. 
um, to be able to do this. Cause Ian, Ian's out of town at work. Um, so my kids, like <laughs> my, my kids aren't here so I can like do it without having to, you know, my, my kids are little. So every half an hour I have to like go make them a meal that they then like dump on the floor and don't eat. <laughs> so, so th this is a good time for me to be able to, you know, give you guys attention <laughs> without them interrupting. Um, but, but yeah, so, so last year, like I bought all these seeds and one, you know, so one thing I'm talking about over and over and over again in this video is that I try to know what I want to buy. I'm, I try to be really strict when I go to buy seeds because I want to know what I need. I don't want to buy stuff just because it looks cool. I only want to buy things that like have, have a, have a spot, right? Like I don't, I don't want to buy aspirational seeds. I don't want to buy seeds that one of these days I'll put in the garden. I only want to buy what I'm going to be planting for that year. And you know, if I keep thinking about the seed over and over and over again, then, then I will buy it in the year that I've decided to allocate it space in the garden. Um, you know, here, like, I'll show you guys this. So Ian and I, we went and like, we had like, it took a four hour, four hour coffee shop that moved into a dinner date. Um, and I really wanted him to do this with me before I ordered seeds. He like, Ian's the best man in the world. And, uh, I'm the luckiest woman ever because he will... If, if you guys think I'm talking your ear off about seeds, imagine poor Ian. This is like, what's happening here is like all day, every day for him. This is like, this is me nonstop in the winter. The reason why I can like literally do a 24 hour live video talking about seeds is that I, I'm just always, always talking about seeds. I like don't stop. Um, but yeah, so like this here, <laughs> Here, like this, this is a pretty clear one. So this, this is me making, making like a garden plan. So this, this is like, this is my flower farm. And this is like where I have some kale right now, you know? And so basically like I'm trying to decide what's going to get planted where, you know, What's this? I don't, oh, this this is the bottom half of my farm. This is this. Yeah, I definitely do succession planting. I'm like every week I'm planting. Um, and for like in regards to the Salanova, um, every two weeks I was seed starting Salanova, and every two weeks I was taking out Salanova if it was if it was ready if it either. It had been harvested and I was taking it out or if I hadn't harvested it like last year because I had way more than I could sell. So last year there was only there's only so long it can stay out. It had about an eight week window after transplanting before it it stopped being good before it started to go bitter. Um, so, you know, the, the seeds that I transplanted every two weeks then there was like a couple weeks worth of, you know, so I'd plant seeds and then they stayed in the tray for, um, for four weeks before I transplanted it. So I would have seedlings that were two weeks old when I was seeding other ones. And then I'd also have, you know, a set of four week old lettuce seedlings that were going out into the garden. And then I'd go out there and I'd, I'd, remove the eight week old like eight week as in you know from transplant um i removed all the eight week old cell like lettuce and put new seedlings in and it didn't matter if it was stuff that had been harvested so it was just like a stump or if it was like a full head of lettuce at that point it it wasn't it wasn't prime lettuce i don't want to be selling anything that that isn't perfect because that would, that would be bad. <laughs> if I was selling bitter lettuce, no one would buy my lettuce. Um, yeah. So it was coming out and getting replaced and, and every, every two weeks, you know, on, on a pattern and hopefully going into the future, I'll be able to sell enough lettuce that the rotation will be every week. 
you know, it'll be like, oh, it's Monday. Today is lettuce day. I seed, I seed eight trays. I, you know, remove eight trays that I, I then, you know, remove from the field and, and replace the transplants. And, you know, it, it's just a constant thing. And then as, you know, after, because the Salanova was like about four weeks in the field when it was ready for a harvest. And then you could cut it again at six weeks. And then, you know, you could cut it again at eight weeks. So got like three cuts and then, and then it was gone. Then it was out of there. Um, so, you know, the idea would be if you plant it every week, you know, every week there's a couple beds that can get cut off of it, you know, and, and it's just, it's a rotation that just keeps going. Um, you know, another good example is the radishes, you know, 25 days for the radishes. I'd pull like, you know, I'd have a 25 foot bed of radishes for my farmer's market. I'd rip them out, bunch them, sell them, empty spot, you know, more radishes go in. And, and, you know, for the radishes, because the radishes don't keep in the field, every week I had to plant radishes. Because if I didn't, you know, if I plant radishes every second week, the radishes, you know, if I planted 50 feet of radishes every second week, um, the, the radishes that, so, you know, 25 days later I go and I harvest out the, you know, 25 feet for the one market, they're perfect. But when I go to harvest next week on the other 25 feet that I planted, they're, they're overgrown. They're too big. Um, so those, those specific ones, you know, you need to be really on the ball for the succession planting. And um, same, same, you know, every, every single thing I grow. The only stuff that wasn't succession planted was tomatoes, you know, cause they're, they go in, they, they harvest, um, you know, and then, the the flowers I didn't I didn't some of like the zinnias and the cosmos I didn't succession plant um but I might um this this coming year because I I want to try to get them to produce a little bit earlier um but yeah even last year even zucchini I I planted you know the zucchini started to fade out and so you know like a month after I planted my main bed of zucchini I planted a, another section of zucchini you know, it came, my zucchini that I planted, I think it's like 40 days. So 40 days came, this, the peak of my first planting of zucchini was starting to go, you know, they were overlapping for a little bit of time, you know, by, by two months, my zucchini weren't looking so great. Those came out, something else goes in. Uh, man, if someone was selling radish seed pods, I would buy them because I love them. <laughs> They're like my favorite thing to, to eat. I would never grow radish seed pods to sell because like, what can you sell them for? Right? Like they're a pain in the butt. Um, but there's, there's tons of stuff that I, I personally wouldn't grow to sell. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm going to grow big tomatoes this year for the farmer's market. Um, I don't even know if I want to grow big tomatoes to sell just because, you know, they, they're a little tricky. People, I was annoyed. People would like mash my tomatoes at the farmer's market. I'm like, you know, what, like, what are you doing? <laughs> it's ripe. I picked it ripe. Like now, now it's no good. Um, but yeah, the, honestly, the, it's with the farming, it's totally different from the home gardening because it's part of the equation is, is how much work is it? Um, you know, like a good example is I, I planted out a bunch of walking onions that I was growing as, as a green onion and the, you know, the green onion sold super well, but to process like to get a dig up the green onions and then clean all the dirt out of the roots or even to snip off the roots after i'd like pulled it out and like peel back the brown layers um it was so much work that you know i was kind of like eh, i don't know like it like it wasn't even worth my time to dig them up after i after i'd planted them to get them to the market because it's just so so much labor um so what I actually started doing was, you know, I had a knife and I'd cut them off, you know, just a little bit below the dirt, but I'd leave all the roots and everything in there. So then when they came up, they came like without the, the roots and then they cleaned a lot faster. 
And I had customers at the farmer's market being like, I've never seen onion, like green onions sold like this. They always have like a bit of a root on them. But, you know, it was the only way that I was able to kind of speed up the process to get green onions to the market without it, you know, taking so much labor that the, the green onions would have had to, you know, be sold for a stupid amount of money. Um, you know, and, and customers, you know, if, if you're using a green, you need those little bit of roots on there will help you for, for shipping. But, you know, my green onions were getting harvested morning of, you know, they give them a week, you know, my customers have a week with them, you know, they, they should be good. Right. Um, so there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of ways to not make money farming <laughs> is basically, is basically the moral, the moral of that story. Um, you need to constantly be focused on, on like the, the actual cost of what you're doing. Um, you know, like going back, I don't know if you were here, but you know, I was talking about cucumber, like looking at cucumbers and tomatoes and they were $2 a seed. And you know, if, if your focus was on, oh, I need to get my seed cost down to like, you know, I need to, that's too expensive for seed. Um, if your focus is on that, some like in the context of farming, uh, you know, sometimes you're missing the bigger picture, right? Um, so, so yeah, like spending two bucks on a seed that's going to produce twice as much product, you know, a two, a two buck seed that's going to grow you a hundred dollars worth of product is worth infinitely more than a 50 cent seed that's only going to grow you $50 worth of product. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot to those equations and, you know, it, you know, it's, it, it's exciting to grow everything and, and to like have all these new and these fun things. So it, it can be really hard to, to make these, these like decisions. Yeah. Ian, Ian and I were, you know, like everyone's been super excited about all the flowers. We have like a lot of, of new subscribers that have joined us. And I think it's a lot of it is based on um, coming from like a flower cut flower video that I have. And so we've been getting, like, we've been talking with a bunch of people and they all, they really love the flowers. Um, and when we first bought the property, I was, I was crunching numbers on if, if we wanted to potentially be a flower farm, um, because, you know, we, we have a small space, our property is like two and a half acres. So like kind of maximum growing space is, is about a, an acre to an acre and a half, um, so like I was, I was trying to figure out like what, what would be like a good, like, you know, business. Like, so, you know, as I like, crunching a bunch of numbers and, you know, doing like market analysis, like looking at like, you know, what, what was going on in the local market. Cause you can grow, you can grow anything, you know, like I could grow an acre and a half of, of flowers, but can I sell an acre and a half of flowers? And, you know, I, I decided that I didn't think it would be a good idea. Like I, it, it would be a bad, it would be a very difficult business to be, to make profitable if I decided to, you know, do what I did on the thousand square feet on this, on the, the concept of an acre and a half, you know, I'd, I'd be able to grow all this stuff, but it would take you know, 10 people working full time just to try to sell it. And even then what I could sell it for, you know, wouldn't cover the cost. There's just, there's too many flower farmers doing, you know, there's too many people selling flowers to be able to make an actual stand alone business in my area. I believe in, in like just, you know, cut flowers. Um, one thing I almost did that, though, was to be a peony farm. And that's because, uh, where we are is, so we're in like a small city, a large town. And, um, the, 
you know, like there's there's only so much market here. Um, but there is four hours from here is Vancouver, and that's like a really big market. So if I was doing a cash crop, like peonies, which you know, they flower and they have, you know, like a one month window of when the harvest is. Um, if, if I was doing a crash crop like that and only the one thing, what I could then do is I could hire a, like, you know, a, a refrigerator truck to take down my, my cash crop of peonies like every week for the one, for the one month. And, you know, at that, at that point, you know, the numbers start to make sense because, you know, it, it was, I did numbers and it said that like a peony farm, you could do 10,000 peonies to an acre and a peony, once it comes to maturity, would produce 10 flowers per plant. So 100,000 peonies, if they sell for a buck a stem, you know, when you count in the cost of shipping them down to Vancouver and by labor, you could probably get to a $50,000 profitable business, you know, and there it is. And the cost to set up a peony farm would be about $100,000. And, you know, the the truth of the vegetable farm is by the time we're done, it's going to cost us $100,000 to set up the vegetable farm. Um... Yeah, okay, so this this is like a very long-winded story that eventually comes back to Dalius. <laughs> so stick with me. Um, yeah, so like, I was like, that would make sense, but to do the mixed cut flowers where, you know, I'm trying to sell them at the farmer's market and, you know, I'm trying to get like, you know, like local florists to buy my flowers. If I had a, an acre and a half of that, it I, I don't think I'd be able to do it. Um, the the zinnias that I grew this year, I crunched the numbers on the zinnias. I have 50 foot beds. So my flower farm was was um, a thousand square feet. Um, I had five beds. I probably only was picking off about like three and a half of them because I had a bunch I had a bunch of things that didn't work out. Maybe maybe even three actually because I mostly had a bed of zinnias, which was a 50 foot bed, a bed of cosmos, and I only was picking about half of that. And then I had a uh, half a bed of amaranth and a half a bed of basil. Like pretty much everything else failed on me. But with, with the amount that my 50 foot bed of zinnias produced at, you know, even at my cheap $10 market bouquets it, and with my season ending super early because of early frost and starting super late because I like totally messed up my transplants and everything. I like it would be easy to get $2,000 a bed in zinnias like with the potential of it going up to $4,000 a bed on zinnias at, at a 50 foot bed. Right. And so you no, know, if you times that by an acre and a half, you know, the potential money is is just insane. But on like, you know, I couldn't sell a bed of zinnias, right? And you know, this this coming year, my my flower plan is that I'm gonna have a bed and a half of zinnias. You know, we're hoping that with having two markets and then selling in front, we're gonna set up a roadside stand. The flowers actually sold really well at, like at the house. Um, we're hoping to be able to sell a hundred bouquets a week. So that's like, you know, a thousand bucks a week. And then the flower season, if, if I work it out well, could be up to 14 weeks. So, you know, if we, if we do that, we'll make as much money on flowers as we made on everything last year. Um, but it doesn't necessarily compound over and over again. Um, and then, okay, so back to the beginning. This is when we get to dahlias. Uh, it's, it's easy to love flowers and then to hear how productive zinnias are and to get like super, super excited about that and then to want to go out and make, and make this massive flower farm. Um, but like at a certain point being super super excited about flowers almost leads to to making bad decisions. I think part of the reason why 
we had the success that we did with the flowers last year is that I don't really care about flowers very much. So when I was making my flower decisions, I was being like super, super practical. I was like, what is the easiest thing to grow? Like what, what's going to be the thing that is going to be the least amount of work. And so all my flower decisions were completely based on um, like just production. Like, you know, will it produce early? Will it be low labor because I don't have to, you know, tr be transplanting them out over and over again? Like, you know, like what I said I do with the lettuce, right? Like I was, I was making these like, you know, really unemotional, practical decisions that uh, I don't see a lot of the smaller flower farms in the area making, um, you know, like there's no world in which I will ever grow uh, <laughs> eucalyptus and lithianthus and ranunculas <laughs> and, and all these other things because they're hard. <laughs> like, I'm like, I like, no, I don't care that like, that's difficult. Like, why would I do that? Why, like, why would I put all this effort in? Like, sure, they look amazing, but I can't get more money for it at the farmer's market than I can for a zinnia, which is, like, super easy and produces like crazy. So, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, and I feel like I'm only able to make those decisions because I'm not, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not like, oh, but they're so beautiful. Like, I'm, like, I have this, like, you know, distance from the flowers that makes it easy to look at them as, as like a profitable crop uh, instead of as something that I love, right? Like, you know, I, I'm going to make bad decisions about eggplants when it comes to the farmer's market because I love eggplants and I'm passionate about eggplants. Like I, the practical decision when it comes to eggplants and the farmer's market is that I should not grow eggplants like at all like I should I shouldn't even grow eggplants for myself I should instead buy them at the farmer's market because they sell so badly that you can buy them for really cheap in the season I shouldn't even bother to do it but I'm passionate about eggplants so I want to grow eggplants and then they'll end up coming to the farmer's market with me and they won't sell um which is fine because I'll just turn them into baba ganoush and then <laughs> I will not be sad at all but so it's, it's easy to make those bad business decisions in, in like the flower farm when you love flowers and it's easy to make those bad decisions in, in the farm and, and to lose sight of what is actually making money and what is losing money because it's, it's really easy to be like passionate about it. Um, and then to get to the dahlias. So we, <laughs> I bought 240 dinner plate dahlias that's like part of my seed order for this year. And then we're also going to be experimenting with doing dahlias from seed this year. And this is a horrible business decision. <laughs> this is like, you know, it's not a bad YouTube decision because I know all you guys are going to like love seeing all these, seeing all these dahlias. And, and the only reason why I'm doing it is that like I've fallen in love with dahlias. Like I like I really want to have all these dahlias. Um, but when it comes to the farmer's market, like the, no one's going to value dahlias over over zinnias and they're going to they're way harder, you know, and and, you know, it's 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 a bad decision for the business, but I'm doing it because, because I want to grow dahlias. Um, you know, and obviously there's, there's space for some of that in, in a profitable business. Um, but it's hard for it not to, to slowly, you know, like you gotta keep your eye on, on profitable. <laughs> Or else it, it all just turns into into dahlias and eggplants and then, you know, and then it can't sustain itself because if if you can't pay yourself for the work that you're doing, then then you might as well, you know, just have a home garden. But yeah, I mean, for the marigolds, they apparently sell well, I've heard, you know, uh, like we for filler, we did... 
we did the basil and I loved it because it smelled so good. We had a lemon one and we also had had a cinnamon one. And like, you know, the scent of the, it like made this, the flowers smell amazing. You know, zin zinnias don't smell like anything. Um, but my, my mom, my mom loves lilies. She absolutely like loves having lilies in the house because she loves the smell of it. But at the same time, I've seen people like come into her house when she has like fresh lilies inside and they're like, I, I, like, I have to leave. I can't stand I can't stand the the smell of lilies. So, you know, like growing something for scent, like when when you're selling it, um, you know, it like everyone's so different. You know, it's like the that, you know that's that's kind of the one thing about flowers. One of the things that really blew my mind about about the food, you know, selling at the farmers market was that everyone, you know everyone buys food. It was, it was super, super easy to sell. Um, you know, and, and that was something that I kind of had never thought about before. Um, you know, that, that, uh, you know, when, when you think about doing like sales, you know, there's like your ideal customer, right. And there's only so, so many people that are going to be your customer for that product. And, you know, obviously the, 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 your cut, everyone eats food, but not everyone's going to be like a farmer's market customer, but everyone who comes to the farmer's market pretty much is there to buy vegetables, like fruit and vegetables. So you, like you, you have a lot of like conversion potential when you're at the farmer's market with food. Um, and then when you go to flowers, you know, that, that conversion drops way down, then, then you're back into the category of, you know, everyone else, like all the crafters and, you know, the people who are selling jam and things like that at the farmer's market where, you know, only, only a certain number of people are going to consider to buy flowers. Um, where's the food, you know, it's, if, if it looks good and it tastes good and you're consistent and, you know, you have nice branding and everything, it, it really makes it an easy job to, to be at the farmer's market. Um, okay. This thing that I've been trying to tell you guys about for half an hour, and then I have to go, um, because I'm running into, into have to go into the school last time. Okay. So I've been trying to say this. I try to be really strict about what I buy. Oh yeah. This is why I had those papers, right? So I made, we made this these oh no did I lose my papers that'd be really bad these are like these are my most precious this is my precious right now this okay so you can see just how organized I am guys you can marvel at my excellent uh, paperwork skills clearly I'm a professional businesswoman uh because this is the most important paper that I have right now <laughs> and what this little little uh gem is is this is my my garden this is like my farm plan um this is every single one of these dashes is a bed and this is like what what we're prioritizing for growing so this i made ian do this with me um over over the holidays um because i needed to do this before i went seed shopping because last year I just like willy nilly bought seeds and then I ended up with stuff like this, which, you know, okay. Like, so this is like a massive bag of like baby greens, lettuce mix, you know, it was like 25 bucks. Um, oh, that's funny. That's late. You know, it's the middle of the day here. It's like almost two 30 here for me. And like, it's super random video time. Um, so I'm, I, Thank you guys for all like coming and joining me because I, I know that this is this is a slightly weird <laughs> live video time. So I'm I, I appreciate that there's so many of you here. I've I've never had this many people hang out with me while I obsess about seeds for like hours and hours. All right, here's here's another example. This this is like a red Russian kale, this big massive bag. You know, it costs 30, 34 bucks. This is enough to do multiple beds of, of baby, baby greens. Um, 
And I bought this stuff because I was like, oh, I'm going to want to try to do baby greens for the market. Um, but I hadn't done this <laughs> before I bought my seeds last year. And uh, yeah, yeah, I think I think you'd uh, have more than enough to eat with this. <laughs> There's like it's like a million seeds in here. Um, yeah, so I hadn't I hadn't figured out what I had space for. Um, cause you know, kind of going back to like talking about like what is profitable, what is smart, like, you know, trying to make these practical business decisions. Um, you know, I need to pry when it comes to deciding what goes in the, to the beds, I need to prioritize what is going to be like profitable. What's going to, what's going to sell well, what, what I'm going to be able to sell lots of, you know, lettuce and carrots were really big sellers last year. So, you know, I need, I need to have lots of that more so than I need to experiment with baby kale to see if it'll sell. I already know lettuce and carrots do really well. So, so I need to, I need to make sure that I have, you know, all the space for lettuce and carrots booked out. And Ian, Ian was trying to, Ian was trying to be bad. He was trying to be be a bad influence on me. Uh, and he was saying that he was like, oh, well, if you run out of space, I'll just like make you more, more beds. I'll just till more space. Um, but we've, we've actually expanded. Yeah. Everything, everything's 50 foot beds. Um, and we added, yeah. So we, we added another greenhouse at the end, which Ian needs to redo because he did a bad job. Um, and then we also made another 10 beds. So we, we made another, uh, 2000 square feet garden. And that, he got that all prepped up and ready for me. And I planted seven of those beds with garlic. And then the spot that I had garlic last year is now open to do other things. And where we actually had the garlic last year, we're going to transition that area into, into perennials, hopefully. Um, yeah. So, so basically like, you know, I counted everything and I think I have 40 beds in total. And Ian was like, just buy whatever and we'll till more. But, you know, last year I had about 30 beds and I was really maxed out on time. And we're also running into limitations for what our irrigation will do. So last year I was actually running into issues of being able to water everything just because there's only so many hours in the day. And until we do a really big um, overhaul on the irrigation on our property, which is going to be like a massive and very expensive job. Um, until we do that, I don't think that I can really go any bigger than what I have, you know, what I currently have without um, doing things poorly basically like nothing grows here without water. Um, so there's, there's no point going any bigger and then watering stuff less. Um, some, some of the stuff had to be watered every day because we have like lettuce in and it gets hot here. We get like, you know, we get up to like, you know, 35, you know, kind of like 33, like is kind of like, you know, good average. We'll, we'll like hover between 30 to 35 for a lot of like July and August. Um, so a lot of this stuff has to be watered every day. Um, you know, and then other stuff I can water every second day, but yeah, <laughs> you know, there's, there's, there's only so many beds that I can turn the water on for, for like the water volume. So yeah, water, like, I'm not running out of water. I'm running out of time. Um, so if I get like automated irrigation and I also size up my irrigation line so that it has more volume going through it, then, then I can water more. Um, but, but yeah, so this, this thing that I have here, this is us prioritizing everything. Yeah. What like water rights are crazy expensive here too. Our property is is it is a farm property. We only got farm status on it, um, like this this after the growing season 
because you have to produce ten thousand dollars to be able to you know be officially a farm um but we are a farm so our property came with water rights for the entire area so like that that was definitely something that i hadn't thought about when we first went looking um just because there's a lot of water in the area but yeah uh or like lots of irrigation already set up in the area, but that that's a huge thing. Like there was one property that we really liked that we looked at and it had a well and like, you know, I was basically like, we can't farm with a well here. Um, okay. So, so this list I had, like, this is, this is everything that I have space to grow. And, and we basically, we were like, okay, like, you know, this, this is like the garlic. And it's like, okay, like that's already planted. So like, we can't, we can't like, you know, allocate the garlic bed to something else. It's already in there. And then we were like, okay, this is how much lettuce we're going to have. And we know we have to have this and we know we have to have that, you know, and then it got down and down and down. And then it was like, okay, now we have three beds open. Um, you know, what, what's more important to grow out of everything. And because I did this before I went seed shopping, um, you know, I, I'm hoping I didn't do this again this year. Um, and th this, we, I do want to experiment with baby greens, which is what I bought this for. And we allocated for it this year. So this seed, this, this isn't going bad. Um, honestly, sitting here at this point, I went through my seed. I actually got rid of a bunch of seed. We do have seed swaps in the area. And so I'm going to bring my seeds down to the seed swaps. And if I was sitting here and I was going like, I'm never going to grow baby kale, I, I would have taken this and I would have divided this into, into small bags and, and sent it off to the seed swap. Um, just because, you know, like I don't, I, I go, I do actually go through my seeds and I get rid of stuff. Anything that I like grew and I don't like, I get rid of, like, I'm like, what's the point of keeping these seeds? Like, you know, they're, there's other people who want them. Um, yeah. And then, you know, I also am aware when I, when I buy the stuff, I like, yeah, I know I buy these huge, crazy things. And I mean, like the carrot is a good example. Like I, like I'll probably send some of this carrot off, um, this year or more likely I might donate it. There's, um, there's like a charity farm and I might just donate them the carrot seed. I might like go down with my cedar and be like, do you want me to like plant? <laughs> do you want me to plant a couple thousand square feet of carrots for you guys? Um, just cause yeah, like, you know, I don't, I like, I don't want the seed to go to waste. That That's part of like why I'm so strict. Um, but yeah, so, you know, even, even though I like, you know, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to stay organized. I guess that's the point of what I'm trying to say with this stuff. I'm trying to stay organized. I'm trying not to just buy like, you know, stupid amounts of stuff that I'm not going to plant. Um, you know, my, this is my scale, right? Um, but th this is like, kind of like a lesson to you guys, like in your home gardens. Um, you know, if, if you don't have space for, for kale, like don't buy it. Right. Um, worst case scenario, you, you regret not having kale and then it, it becomes on your priority list next year. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to, uh, to do, to do this. Yeah. I don't know. Sorry, buddy. I don't think anyone's going to donate any Salanova seed to you. <laughs> uh, it's, it's too expensive. I, I will say this, like after like being like, oh, like it's painful. My, oh, my like, you know, I'll, I'll save that conversation for when I do my Johnny's seed unboxing, but it's my biggest order. It like money wise is from Johnny's and it's, you know, it's going to be this tiny little box because all it basically is, is like my Salanova. Basically like, you know, I'm going to get this many seeds from William Dam. Like this is how much I've ordered from William Dam and it'll be $600. And then my Johnny's order, which is going to be like a tiny box of like 10,000 lettuce seeds is going to be $700. And <laughs> it's worth it. It's worth the money. 
you know, I, I definitely am going to make the money back and then some, um, and you know, but I, w I will say this, I did order a few other things. Um, the, I, I'm in some farming like Facebook groups and, you know, I kind of like just like fly on the wall, like listen to all their like, you know, variety conversations and, um, because one of my biggest issues is it's hard to grow in the heat here. Um, so, so the, every, like they all hate how expensive the Salanova is. Um, and so they've been talking about Mir, M-U-I-R. And that, that's the lettuce that the people who just can't, <laughs> can't pay, who are like, I just can't do it. I can't pay the money for the Salanova. Um, they, they, they've been buying the Muir uh, to be the substitute. Um, I'm just, uh, the sal it just keeps so good in the heat. Like for me, for me if, if all it was, was that I need a lettuce that grew really well in the heat, um, I'd... I'd be more willing to find something, but the Salanova, it, the, the leaves are like really thick. They're, you know, they almost remind me of, you know, like a romaine or even like an iceberg with how much like moisture and density there is. And because of that, after you harvest it, like, you know, for me to put it out on my table for four hours in the heat in the summer to sell it at the farmer's market, it like, it, doesn't it it can handle the heat even after harvesting and like that that's that's worth the money right and and I don't know necessarily that anything else does that right like the mirror might and the mirror is only good in the heat it apparently is isn't very good for the cold you know and and the fact that the salanova is like survived these like crazy cold temperatures um I don't know. Yeah. I, I bought some mirror cause it, and it, it's still expensive for lettuce. Um, it's not like Salanova expensive, but it still is like a bit pricey. Um, and I bought some from like William Dam had it. And so I, I bought some and I'm going to, I'm going to try it out. I'm going to, I'm going to see what it's like. Um, because it's, you know, it's supposed to be good. Yeah. I mean, it's, the Salanova, you can do cut and come again. I, I, like the variety that my favorite variety is the green sweet crisp and it's it, you know it grows in every single condition it's cut and come again the flavor I don't like lettuce like I'm like nah, whatever lettuce but like I want to eat the Salanova lettuce like every day like I, I want I want a bowl of this green sweet crisp Salanova every day it's like it's heavy so when you're, cause you sell by weight, right? So it's, you know, it's heavy, it's fluffy. So it like fills up the bag really nicely. It's not like flat. So it, it looks, it looks really, um, you know, like really lush. And like, it looks like you're having this huge amount of lettuce when, you know, when you just cut off the head, it, it creates this, you know, really, really beautiful salad. Um, you know, after it's picked, it lasts forever. It's good with the heat. It's good with the cold. And, you know, it sits. They they wilt at my market. If if I leave them out for four hours on on a super hot market, they wilt. I take them home and I fill my sink up in my kitchen with cold water. I throw them into the cold water. I leave them like until we're ready to sit down and eat a salad. I pull it out. It looks like I just picked it, and it's lost zero of the sweetness through the through the wilting process so we're talking about salanova <laughs> salanova lettuce it's very expensive you can only buy it from johnny's i have to pay a million dollars in shippings and customs but i'm i like it's hard for me to i don't even know how they did it i don't know how they did it i don't know how they made something so good it's you know it's we live in a wonderful, we, we live in a wonderful time where Salanova lettuce exists. And I can talk to all of you guys on the internet about, I can, I can talk to you over in UK about why you should buy it. That's all I have to say. It's, it's a, it's an engineering marvel of our times. Okay. I have to go now. I literally have used up all of the time that I have. 
Um, but I do have my West Coast Seeds um, seed order that came in. So I will, I'm going to do a live video. I'll do it again, do this again next week. Um, I will actually talk about the seeds that I have, unlike, unlike this week where, you know, I didn't list things off because I am pretty excited about what I have in my West Coast stuff because I got some, I bought a few Asian vegetables from them. And then I might, I might also talk about my hot peppers and my, my plan for the hot peppers with that. Um, cause I think I have some, some fun hot peppers in there. Um, but thank you guys so much. Thanks for hanging out. Um, sorry that this is like literally an entire day. This, this is literally the worst over length movie anyone's ever watched. <laughs> if you've been here for, for this whole time, but I, I really appreciate that, uh, you guys all indulge me. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll see you guys next time. Okay, bye now.